everybody, and welcome to the RHAP BNB for episode two of Survivor 46. My name is Mike Bloom, and somehow across two weeks, we have four hours of US Survivor to talk about. We're veering into Avengers Endgame territory, even though we are far from the endgame, though people are certainly playing like it, considering some of the moves that are being made. We're here to break down yet another two-hour version of Survivor 46, and we will get into all the good, the bad, and I wouldn't say necessarily ugly, but certainly a lot to discuss. Let me welcome in this week's panel, of course, my ride or die, Liana Boris. Liana, how are you? I'm doing fantastic. I've eaten a bunch of ants in preparation, so I've got my protein, and I'm ready to go. And I've eaten a bunch of uncles, so that's I got a lot of gas. <laughs> Not an uncle aunt aunt joke. <laughs> this this makes me very concerned as someone who is going to be an uncle in about two months. Oh, Jordan, get ready. Be careful. I'm coming for you. My, yeah, my you're, staying away. you're seizing yourself. Pull I'm yourself with some seeds, baby. Oh no, I'm staying away from you, Mike. I'm no never, bagel. never, Jordan. I can't resist having you on. Of course, uh, bearing the lead a bit in terms of his introduction, but I'll do it formally. Someone I'm so excited to have back, host of the newly revamped version of Twish uh, over on the main feed of Rob has a podcast. Someone who I definitely think could sit here and name 118 Yankee players off the top of his head, Jordan Kalish. Yeah, uh, M Michael J. Clark and I were doing that the other day on Twitter. We didn't get quite to 128, but we did get we we got pretty far. We were going in the weeds with the Yankees. And I, I'm sure that uh, the three of us can do this with uh, Survivor contestants. And maybe between the three of us, I think we could get everyone. I'm, I'm pretty sure. Uh, Mike, it is, uh, and Liana, it is great to be back. Love, love doing the B&B. It's been a lot of seasons in a row at this point. Uh, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to go. Wearing my uh, purple shirt. Uh, try, to, try to give Yanu some luck going forward because I don't want to see them at travel again. Yeah, uh, I mean, I think at this point, uh, listen, sometimes we like to support uh, the tribes or the sports teams that are perhaps not necessarily being up to snuff. Again, as sort of a, a Yankees fan, as of late, you're probably familiar with that. So, yeah, you just got to infuse some spirit into Yanu. They've hit their low point at this point, but maybe they feel in a post-Jess world, they'll be able to hoist this massive block of a four to six to six deficit above their head and actually keep it there instead of dropping it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I hope so. I, I would like to see, mainly because I want to see, I feel like there's interesting dynamics on these other tribes too, and I want to see what happens. Yeah, mm -hmm. so that being said, let, let's talk about, first off, I guess we'll start with the fact that this was another two-hour episode. Because I've seen, you know, so some back and forth, mostly in the camp of like, too long. Uh, you know, we, and listen, this is not at the feet of the show. This is at the feet of the network. It's very clear that I think if you would approach Jeff Probst beforehand being like, okay, there's one episode that's not the premiere or the finale that you could extend out to two hours. I don't think Jeff would be like, yeah, let's do the one round with two days to it, a single challenge, no journeys, nothing miscellaneous, and like a relatively rote vote out at the end of the day. So I think for what they had to sort of work with, uh, I thought, you know, it was it was relatively well done. First half was definitely a bit slower when it was clearly, I'm not one to quibble with camp life, but I do feel like, especially with the NAMI stuff, it was important to know those dynamics with Venus. We kind of went back to that well a bunch of times as opposed to maybe finding out some of the other perspectives of what's going on on that try, but still very important to know. But in my opinion... Once we hit that challenge, we never looked back. I thought the episode was absolute fire moving forward. Uh, the one staple that Yanu lacks currently. And so I'm excited to get into it because there is going to be a lot to get into between obviously the very serious stuff and wild stuff that was happening with Yanu in the second half. And then, of course, Liana and true B&B fair, ridiculous things like sitting around and naming hundreds of songs. Right. I, I think for me, in terms of the timing of the episode, I've watched the episode twice. I watched it once the night it aired with commercials. I watched it once afterwards um, with without commercials. And I would say that 
for me, the two hours probably was too much, but I felt it so much more when I watched it with the commercials. Without commercials, mm-hmm. actually did okay. Like it was, there was enough going on, and I think that there was enough information, except for I like that you mentioned that they went back to Venus's perspective over and over and over again, kind of for the same thing over and over and over again. That was really all that felt very repetitive. Other than that, I actually I actually kind of liked it. I don't know. Uh, look. Hour and a half, I think, is that perfect sweet spot. So oh, I'm yeah. happy that they're going with the 90 minutes moving forward. But without the commercials, it definitely didn't drag as much. Although I did um, I did skip the challenge because that was very boring to me. Just watching them hold blocks, drop blocks, hold drop, blah, 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 blah. blah. That was like incredibly boring. I didn't care about that. Um, but otherwise, I thought that all the camp life stuff still provided some element of, oh, these are the dynamics. These are the relationships. And that's the kind of content that I'm looking for. Yeah, what do you think, Jordan? Is 90 minutes the sweet spot for you now that we've sort of experimented in the one hour and two hours significantly? Yeah, I I do agree with the results of uh, Rob's unscientific poll that he did on Twitter. I do think that 90 minutes is is the best length for a, a Survivor uh, episode. It's it's hard for me to complain about getting more Survivor, but as someone who watches every week at a viewing party, it's kind of nice when the episode ends and then you can hang out with the people that are there. It was sort of like we got two hours of Survivor. Yes, with commercials in between, so people were able to talk and chat during commercials. But then after the episode, everyone was like, "Okay, I'm done," and we I think we all basically just left at that point. So. Um, I will say I had a similar experience to Liana, though. I literally just rewatched the episode uh, right before recording this and watching on my couch, being able to skip through commercials. I mm-hmm. I was fine with it. There, w- there wasn't any scene that I was like, oh, you know what? This this was boring. We should get rid of this. Um, but I also do think that th- not everything was like totally necessary to see. But I'm not complaining. I would rather have two episodes, sorry, two hour episodes than one hour episodes. Um, so from that perspective, it's it was a better length for me than most of the episodes in survivor history so i i didn't mind it but i do prefer the 90 minutes well what's interesting though is that if you take away the commercials the runtime uninterrupted of a two-hour survivor episode is about 90 minutes so maybe yeah. the answer to the sweet spot is <laughs> no like, commercials put, maybe yeah put it on the bbc <laughs> a la drag race uk right and just do it uninterrupted for a full 90 minutes uh maybe that's that's the the ultimate answer though yeah. again that's uh, in a non-capitalistic society cbs cbs would love that that suggestion <laughs> oh yeah oh they'd yeah. eat it up uh oh, it'd be yeah. like when uh peacock did that sort of like fourth quarter no uh, no commercial break broadcast of one of the nfl playoff games like oh companies would be frothing at the mouth certainly to have an uninterrupted two-hour block in prime time mm-hmm. yeah late stage capitalism could never <laughs> so jordan perhaps one of the reasons why uh your viewing party was uh, a little bit ready to go home by the end of it to uh sort of the same perspective that our boot this week kind of was as she's been revealing in exit press was that this second half did certainly feel exhausting from a certain perspective. First, physically, I mean, good God. Liana, I know that maybe one of the reasons why you also want to kind of TiVo Badoop through it is because, like, it was so palpably excruciating for the second yeah. week in a row to have these people consistently hoist and drop and hoist and drop. And then you compound on top of that, you know, something that has certainly been making the rounds and provided a bit of a polarized reaction, which is the sort of treatment of Jess, uh, these plans that were brought in, I would say objectively unnecessarily, but I think your mileage may vary as to like whether or not that ruined your perspective on the episode or not. That by the end, I think people were were feeling a certain odd way about things, which is fitting for a very odd season with a very odd cast. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, you know, when you have after the challenge with however many minutes, 30 minutes left or whatever, you have, okay, Kenzie saying, yeah, I want Jess gone. And then Jess goes like, that's boring in and of itself. Normally when you have that confessional, you're like, oh, that's not what's going to happen. Mm-hmm. Like we're going to get something else. And no, it was all about Jess. And it felt like there was absolutely no way that Jess wasn't going to go in this situation. So it felt like we're just going forward with a foregone conclusion. And then everything else is like, I guess, will she play her shot in the dark? But it seems like that's not going to be the case especially then with the fake idol situation of it all which uh which yeah i think we definitely should talk about um so for me it it was just oh it was just like yeah i know what's gonna happen can we just rip the band-aid off like the the intrigue maybe wasn't as there as much as we've seen in in other episodes here's the next level strategy Jess, to her point, again not exactly in the best mental state out there she lost her water bottle beforehand could you, like, get her to lose her shot in the dark? 
Because that because that happened with Roxroy, apparently, right? That he couldn't play a shot in the dark because he lost it. So, like, could you feasibly just kind of wait? You know, we we find mm. out through the fake idol, you can lead a horse to water, but like they don't know where the water is to even put their mane down at a certain point. Could you just sort of like wait a certain amount of time for Jess to inevitably lose her shot in the dark? Because then the threat of it, Jordan, is completely gone, much like said shot in the dark. I mean, best, based on Jess's own admission from the pr- premiere, that is probably going to happen at some point. So, you know, you, you, I think spend, I do understand the logic behind getting Jess to find this idol so she doesn't play the shot in the dark because you are scared that she, I mean, she can't vote anyway. So I actually, I sort of get the logic, but I don't fully get it. I do think that you are spending a lot of social capital and maybe showing to the other people in your, your alliance and to Banu, who's not really in your alliance. I think you're showing the other people there that you're willing to do anything and maybe they'd be less likely to trust you down the road. Like, I don't see this like cute Tiffany Kenzie thing necessarily staying together long-term because I think they all are pretty similar in that they will do anything to get the vote off of them. So if I'm in this alliance, yes, I'm, I want to be working in the majority now, but I don't know if I could trust anyone else on this tribe, if I'm any of these people. So I, I don't know if I love it in from the long-term perspective of, of staying in this game and being able to trust your allies. Um, I, I do think though, I, I did think originally, like after, after last episode, I was like, okay, if this tribe loses, it's going to be Jess because she is clearly not like connecting with everybody on the tribe. She's losing all the stuff that's it's she's, I, I think she was, very clearly the odd person out outside of Jelinski, who is, uh, you know, for several reasons, uh, more of the odd person <laughs> out. Uh, but anyway, uh, yeah, I, I think that Q, uh, uh, Tiffany and Kenzie did need to vote together because if you, let's say you did get rid of Kenzie here, which I did think was maybe going to happen at certain points during the episode at the next tribal council, it could be a two V two, which, uh, which Q and Tiffany don't want. You have so much more power in this tribe if you get rid of either Jess or Banu. At Tribal Council, when Banu's going around asking, who are you voting for? I was like, wait, are they gonna are they gonna start whispering to each other and voting out Banu? But I think it was like enough misdirection that it didn't feel like a foregone conclusion during the vote that Jess was gonna go. But I do think it made the most sense. Yeah, I think uh, I was sort of buying into what Liana was mentioning of like, we got so much talk about how, oh, this is the plan. This is what's gonna happen. That once we got that conversation between Q and Banu and Jess, which is almost a mirror of like what Kenzie was doing over by the cove of like okay I'm hurting these cats basically Jess and Banu aren't really that big game players so I just gotta manage these chaotic elements I did think for a second because again these people are shrewd AF if the actions of the past five days haven't been clear about that that like yeah there is a chance that Q would potentially take out Kenzie and then just sort of explain to Tiffany the next time of like listen I, I had to take her out she was someone that was already trying to spread our names out there so i was sort of suckered into it but then especially once banu did i'm legitimately gonna say everything he did every single thing you could do in the survivor playbook he threw the book at the walls behind him at tribal council thinking for some reason that it was going to be on him when really it was about liana like three feet to the left of him Yeah, that was very interesting because, I mean, apart from, I guess, the fact that one conversation where Jess tells Banu that his name is coming up, but like, apart from that, everybody else, the target's not on you. It's Kenzie or it's Jess. Like, you're not involved in this situation, really. So for him to have such an intense reaction to everything that was going on, I was like, oh my gosh, what is even happening right now? I I will agree with Jordan that there was a moment where I was like, if I was in that situation, that type of player to me is almost more of a threat than Jess. Because quite, like quite literally I, a threat, because I don't know if you noticed, Liana, he's 11 from Stranger Things. He had the hand out there. He's like, yeah. I'm gonna will Jeff's head to explode. <laughs> yeah. I I just that like that type of energy, I just don't think that I could play with. Like I would really, really struggle to interact with Banu as sweet and as kind and as adorable as he seems. Like, I just don't think that I could handle that. Like I, my brain would be on fire having to deal with Banu. Yeah. On, on fire in front of Jeff, Jeff Probst. 
Um, yeah. <laughs> and I, I believe number four out of the five things when Banu did his his, uh, his little whatever, whatever that was, uh, I believe number four was discipline. And I think what he was showing this episode was the opposite of discipline. And I think Banu's the kind of person, I really like Banu. I really think he seems like a great guy. And I think he's someone that outside of playing a game like Survivor would be a really fun person to hang out with and be around. I do not think I could handle being al al aligned with him on survivor yes. I, I i just think like he's too much of a wild card and yes. going forward if you're q and tiffany maybe you do have reservations about kenzie but it has to be banu like and especially kenzie we're i, I do think kenzie to an extent tr trusts q and tiffany i do think that she is doing too much i think that she Yes, she's being talked about as a social threat, and I think she's a very outgoing social person. I think the person who's playing the better social game is actually Tiffany, because Tiffany is doing it in a way where people aren't looking to potentially vote for her. Kenzie is putting herself out there so much that Q and Tiffany are like, wait, is she actually closer with Jess and Bonnie than she is with us? So I really think Tiffany is playing the more strategic social game out of the two of them. That's interesting because I would go with none of the above. I think Q is playing mm. the best social strategic game. I mean, look at the fact that he was able to convince everybody to vote against Jelinski seemingly in that first vote, including two of his own allies that are like, uh, he's in our alliance. Why would we want to do that? And here, at least from our perspective, he was presented as the one that was sort of in the middle there. And I think part of it is due to positional perspective that he is the physically strongest person. And as these challenges are going to get tougher and tougher, like he is invaluable and arguably the safest person on the tribe, despite the fact that Tiffany has an idol. But I do think the fact that he wielded so much power there, you know, that it seemed that I agree that Tiffany certainly is much less of the flashy threat than Kenzie is. So maybe it's also because Kenzie herself is a flashy person, given the amount of ink that's on her that could be possibly signing her de death warrant. I do think that it's interesting to me that like Jess has expressed in those initial first couple days uh, or first couple minutes, I should say on Yanu, like Kenzie and Tiffany wanted nothing to do with her and that they were very much off on their own. The one person that she felt she could connect with was Q. And that really surprised me. Uh, Cause I think you look at, T at Tiffany, you look at Kenzie and you suspect them as, yeah, these are going to be the social butterflies or the people that are low key in control of the tribe. I did not necessarily expect the the big physical keep the tribe strong mentality to not only prevail, but then also have a bit of this like, but everyone's in good with him too. Mm. I'm really happy to have been wrong about Q because I thought that he was going to come in. A, the, he, he says he's like, it's my way or the highway kind of attitude. Yeah. And I'm like, man, that is going to rub people the wrong way. But everything that you mentioned, Mike, and I think in addition to that, Tiffany having, at least from what we've seen, you see Tiffany in the middle between Q and Kenzie. And Tiffany says like, yeah, Kenzie is loyal to me, but we see her talking to Q, right? And we see that her bringing up like, oh yeah, Kenzie said this, 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 this. Like, it seems like Tiffany is saying everything to Q so in my opinion if tiffany is choosing between the two of them she's chosen q at least based on what we see for her allegiance and so again i want to give q credit for that because i think that that's part of his his doing and i don't know if it's just like he's been he seems to have a very calm energy actually that i yeah. was very surprised about so i don't know if there's maybe something like that people are gravitating towards him as a result of that but to be fair when you're on a tribe with bonu jelinski and jess a category, a category five hurricane would be tame. I, like, again, what this man did was extraordinary at Tribal Council, even like in front of people. You know, he made this argument in Tribal Council like, no, listen, I'm only cuckoo in front of you guys because you know me, right? Like, I'm only this way in front of my friends. I button up professionally. But let's cut to the match chat that we got before the challenge, which is similarly unhinged, where Soda... It's freaking making, uh, you know, it's low key or high key insults at the other tribe. And Bondo's like, let me tell you about Mahatma Gandhi. <laughs> <laughs> like, Over is the furthest thing from my mind. <laughs> and so if I'm sitting there, I'm like, oh, you can't even keep it under the lid in front of other people. That's a demonstrably <laughs> false fact. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god well that's the other thing too like the about q is when bonnie was like in in tribal council and bonnie's talking about like you know i want to it's powerful to like be able to share your emotions and, and let them out and q was like also it's powerful to keep your emotions in like that also requires power and energy and like it's an active choice to do that 
Um, and so to see like the, the differences, the dichotomy between the two of them is so funny. And then to see them at least semi working together is very cute. And it's a good point because I think people have been understandably inspired by individuals like Marianne and Carolyn as they should, right? Again, these are types of players that exude themselves in a certain way that is not often encouraged, uh, especially in pre new era survivor gameplay of, as Q was mentioning, like, you got to keep that locked in. You can't necessarily express yourself out there. I do think the emotionality of a Marianne or a Carolyn, which is like allowing themselves to be vulnerable, is is much less pointed than what Balu is doing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think there's emotion for the, like having emotions on Survivor, and I think Banu did talk about the courage of showing emotions, which is something that I agree with. And I think it does it does show courage to show your emotions in public, especially on Survivor that's going to be shown on a TV show. But I think there is a way to show your emotions where it could help you in the game, where maybe it helps you seem vulnerable and you could connect with people based on these emotions. Or it could be totally over the top where there's really like no strategic reason or strategic benefit behind it. And I think that's what's happening with Banu right now, who it's almost turning these people off. Not almost. It is, I think, turning these people off from working with him down the road. Yeah, I got keep the block cold. Don't keep it yeah. hot. We're yeah, PG, I just, that was a great, great, great quote. Keep, don't keep don't don't make the block hot. Is a great quote by <laughs> Tiffany. Yeah. Well, oh my gosh. I mean, but like, what are you supposed to do in that? Like when Bonu turns around to Kenzie and is like, "Who do I vote for?" And you're Kenzie in that moment, just being like. Just vote for whoever you yeah, want to you, vote you for. You gotta do you, boo boo. <laughs> yeah. And then he goes, yeah, over to Tiffany and Q. And, oh my God. And it was yeah. just like, what is happening right now? Q, Q does a literal stick to the plan at this tribal <laughs> council. I know. I just don't, I mean, I just don't see a universe where if they have to go to tribal again, like Banu's out next, right? Like, unless his shot has- arc works, I guess. Yeah. I don't know. Or it could be a situation, sort of like what they experienced on Lulu, where it was like, okay. Is our die already cast in a manner of speaking? The die that Jess may or may not have lost. Like if we're screwed to just kind of dwindle down to the point that Tiffany made, like, okay, do we start taking swings now? Banu is a much less big threat than someone like Kenzie. There could be a chance that maybe Tiffany and Q or maybe Kenzie herself. We've talked about her really wanting to plant seeds early on. Does she start to dig them up? Does she feel like things have grown enough where she's like, I want to force a tie right now. Q and Tiffany are too tough to break up. I mean, we shake our heads about it, but again, this cast is bananas. I think there's a a reasonable chance that they might pull stuff down and start biting into these bananas even before they're ripe. So if I if I'm Q and Tiffany and I and I'm hope if we if you lose again and, and it's between Banu and Kenzie, you you have to at least just hope that we're not losing again and having to send somebody else home. But if it's between Kenzie and Banu, I would say, look, Banu is someone who everyone else is going to look at at the merge and be like, oh, let's try to bring this person in because he's not going to win. I think Kenzie is the kind of person who is going around and like is very quick to make connections with people where I think that she could be more of a shield for Q and Tiffany than Banu because I don't think anyone's going to say, oh, let's try to take Kenzie to the end. I think it's going to be, oh, let's try to take Banu to the end. So either way, Q and Tiffany will have control if you do have a three-person tribal council. But if you don't, if you only lose one more and you're going to the merge with either Kenzie or Banu, I would much rather have Kenzie there um, for for reliability purposes and also for social shield shield purposes. Well, that's a thing. Like, I remember Q from his uh, his interview with you, Mike, did mention, like, I want to keep people who are going to be shields for me. Mm-hmm. And so I think that that could be potentially part of the logic of, like, who he does consider to be the biggest shield. And then it's kind of a, a question about, well, you know, obviously, Kenzie is like half his size. <laughs> so in terms of a physical threat, yeah, maybe, maybe not so much, although you never know with individual immunity challenges. Uh, but definitely from a strategic perspective, people are already clocking her so much for being like the strategic threat. And so I think that that's something that he can throw out when you get to merge of like, but she's so social. All right. Well, of course, we've talked literally about like everyone else on Yanu, except for the person that was voted off of Yanu, the woman of the two hours, arguably the four hours, uh, which was about the amount of sleep that she got in a period of 10 days. We got to talk about Jess here uh, and has garnered such an interesting response again from the audience through the preseason where I think she had one of the most like unique deliveries I've heard in quite some time where again, I think on Survivor, we're sort of expecting that, 
over eager, excited energy to it, like a Banu. And I feel like Jess was not necessarily a BB-19 Cody deadpan style, but I feel like the way she spoke was so unique compared to, well, again, what we usually get in terms of survivor levels of excitement in confessional, but it might have been a harbinger for one of the reasons why she was pretty much an outcast from the get-go. I guess I want to start, Jordan, by asking you something that Jess has kind of perpetrated out there through the various exit press and social media. Do you think she was screwed by being on the wrong tribe here? Do you think in a different tribe she fares better in this game? So I, I think there is maybe some truth to it. I think that she clearly did not fit in with this tribe and it's harder to see her fitting in worse with another tribe. Um, I think you had people who were, who were clearly just making connections quicker than she was, but a lot of the problems that she had in the premiere were based on things that could have happened no matter what tribe she was on. And, and it's, you know, things beyond her control. She talked, she talked about having ADHD. That's something that could, that would affect her no matter what tribe she's on. Um, I, I think that she, you know, she's prone to losing things and she, she seemed that maybe she was not, you know, the best fit to be in a game where you have to be like, you know, think totally clearly and strategically under a high pressure situation where you're not eating. So I do think that this is something that could have hurt her on any tribe she was on. So I do think maybe she would have fared better on another tribe. Clearly she would, it would be better for her if she was on a tribe that was better at challenges because then she wouldn't be going to tribal council. But I don't think it's purely the tribe. I think there were certain things about her personality that got her in trouble. And I don't think it's like her being a bad person. I don't think it's her being someone who you wouldn't want to be around. She seems like a really cool person. I loved her exit interview and her preseason interview with you. Um, I, I, I just think that some of her, you know, some of her weaknesses that are part of her personality are things that can hurt you early on in a game of survivor. And it's not, this is not like Jess sucks. This is, I, I like Jess. This is just, I, I don't, I think that people have, uh, you know, positives, people have negatives. And I think that the negatives for her are things that are not great for connecting with the tribe early on in the game of survivor, where you would need to make these really fast connections, especially in the 26 day game with the two day rounds. So I, I do think she could have been in trouble no matter where she was. I think, um, I think you never know, like, it's so tough to know because you have such a small group of people that really, yeah. as long as you're in with like two people, that's it two people you can already have a three person semi majority with looking for a fourth right so i and also sorry there's a parade i don't know if you guys can hear the music but it is extremely loud outside my window right now um so i'm just going to go ahead and apologize for that anyway I really, really liked Jess. And I felt like if I was out there, she was someone who I think that I would completely vibe with. And I mm -hmm. think that there's a possibility that if she's just with the right combination of people, that ends up being helpful. Now, the one thing that I would say that is not going to help her no matter what is the lack of sleep. And my yeah. heart goes out to her so, so, so much for this. Absolutely. Because I know how I feel when I get like six hours of sleep. Mm -hmm. I am cranky AF. Like you do not want to be for around six me. six hours of sleep? I need a lot of sleep, like a lot of sleep. Wow. I need eight. I need at least eight hours of sleep a night to like function properly. Okay, and that's Venus, that I princess. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> it's like the one thing I need. I need, need, need sleep. Otherwise, my brain turns into this like very foggy mush sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So to be out there not sleeping at all, not eating, I can't. I mean, I would, my body would just, I would just fall apart into ooze. Like that, I just would not be a functional <laughs> that'd, human. That'd be a hell of an image that. of just like, like Jeff, I can't keep coming back here. You just see like half gelatinous Jess. <laughs> I just the puddle on the ground. Like, half that's, half, that's half that's gelatinous. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. No, I, I, no, and that, yeah. Sorry, oh, sorry, Mike. So yeah, so that's, and that's the other thing with Jess. I mean, I think part of the reason she wasn't getting sleep and she talked, she talked about her shelter literally falling down when I think Jelinski went out to look for an idol at night yeah. and it sa and it saved their lives. Maybe if she was on a tribe that was better at building a shelter, that was better at winning challenges. So they would have fire and they would have more food. Maybe in that case, she's, she's better fed. She's, she's sleeping better. Maybe at that point, she's able to have more energy and actually make connections with people. So I do think from that respect, um, um, she could have maybe done better on, on on a different tribe. And maybe if she was on Nami with someone like Venus, who was also, you know, feeling left out of her tribe, maybe the two of them could have bonded. So if she if she replaced somebody else, I do think she can do better. I'm not I'm not saying that she 
couldn't or that she can't like if she was on a different season maybe she wins i don't know um i i, I just do think that it was there were factors that uh could have that i think would have probably affected her no matter what tribe she was on yeah i do agree with that i, I think it's a little bit of both and that Jess, even before the season came in and was like, yeah, I know I'm a little socially awkward. I'm a little strange. And look, I think the new era has luckily done a bit better for against some of those types that would not necessarily be given the time of day in an older season of Survivor. But it is still a little bit of a roll of the dice. You know, it's it still is a little bit like playing with fire of, OK, you just got to be with a group that might accept that or you might have, you know, a proper challenge winning streak. Compare Jess's sort of trajectory to, I'm going back to like Survivor Token Sheen, Sierra Reed. It wasn't that she had a problem with sleep, but if you remember, she had, I think it was maybe like a sinus infection or a bad virus to start the game. And like, she got lucky that her tribe won that first immunity challenge, which gave her time to recover. So I also do think that her quite literally starting the game in a deficit really didn't help. I am not an expert on really anything by any means. I have no idea if she had fire, even in that first few days, like if she could have recovered from the state that her brain was in, uh, that there was clearly a lot going on with not even the lack of sleep, but like the lack of nutrients as well. That probably didn't help. So it is this odd mixture of factors, right? Of like external and almost internal. Well, and I, I think also you like for me, what it seemed to be that the major decision was was about strength and challenges. And yeah. so it didn't even I mean, we see Tiffany, we see Kenzie talk about saying positive things about Jess. Like Tiffany has the confessional where she talks about like, yeah, it's been really nice to actually get to know Jess and Jess is really sweet and blah, 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 whatever. But at the end of the day, she's like, she was walking. <laughs> she was walking, wasn't hustling and can't spell persistence. So for those reasons, like that's why we're voting her out. And I also think that probably when you, again, lack of sleep, you're just a hot mess and you can't really function that well in challenges. And so if she's still struggling with that, that could have had an impact on in other tribes where she would still be struggling in the challenges. And so maybe it's not as much about social connections, although somewhat definitely for sure. But the the Mianu is just such a hot mess in the challenges that I understand why they would make a decision based on challenge strength. Well, it's interesting, Liana, that you bring up, you know, Tiffany and Kenzie talking about how much they, they were happy to get to know Jess, because I do think something that people have been discussing is uh, whether or not villains are back, despite perhaps a, uh, an indication preseason that they weren't, uh, which sort of corresponds, I would say, in two sort of different perspectives. We have the actions versus the depiction. Uh, so the actions, which we can get into, obviously, is their tactics to create a fake idol, hide it, attempt to have Jess find it, and then if not, just have Q outright give it to her, which, again, I think speaks to maybe him being in the best state of his tribe, that he can walk up to somebody, give them an idol, and then have them play it, uh, even though she didn't necessarily believe that it was real. The other side of that is that I've also seen people say, okay, you know, there are reasons behind why they did what they did, but the reason why they felt a little bad about it is not just because of the state Jess was in and the type of person she is, but because of how it was edited, uh, which I do think came across a bit as punching down. You know, you speak about those compliments, Liana, but then we have things like Tiffany say, all right, let's run down the pros and cons with Jess. Pros, I'll get back to that. Or, uh, or Kenzie basically saying like, Jess is a great person, but she's a bad player. I think there is a certain perspective as well that's coming from the fans as to like, okay, we get it. This was written in the most permanent of ink, much like Kenzie's tattoos. Did the show necessarily need to go down this hard? Now, maybe part of it was the extended runtime or salivating at the idea of doing this fake aisle maneuver, especially early on. I'm sure we all have differing opinions about it. Jordan, what were your thoughts? Was this too much for you? Are you looking sideways at these people now after this? So it did make me feel very bad for Jess. Like I, I, I don't. I when I'm when I'm watching the show, and I like when there are villains on Survivor. I like when there are fun villains on Survivor, and there's people who are doing things that are devious in the game, and they're making moves that are devious. Planning the fake idol, I think, was one of these examples. Which yes, I did feel bad that she, you know, she she stood up and she played a fake idol. But I don't think it was like the most embarrassing time that that has happened in Survivor history. I actually don't think that was the worst part. I think it was some of the confessionals that we got from Tiffany and Kenzie. And for Tiffany and Kenzie, I really think like this is probably right after you lose your third challenge in a row, two of them being immunity challenges where 
Tiffany said it in this episode, anything could happen in Survivor. It could be one of the two of them going homes if, thing, if, if things go sideways. They're in a really stressful situation, and they're probably pretty pissed off at the fact that they felt that Jess was not great in that challenge. So I don't really say, oh, Tiffany and, and Kenzie – uh, or, or Q or bad people because of how they were talking about Jess in this challenge. I did feel bad for Jess that we got all of those confessionals back to back to back on top of them feeding her this, this fake idol. Um, so I, I do think it was, we, we do maybe have some people turning into villains. I don't think it makes the people on the Sianu tribe bad people. Um, but I, I thought there there were some parts of it that felt less fun than like Tyson and, and and Jervis eating coconuts in the woods. I think from my perspective, I don't, I don't know. Like maybe I. Uh, so the reality TV, I didn't watch Survivor as a kid. Like I didn't watch Survivor. I didn't watch Big Brother as a kid. I watch VH1 reality TV shows as a kid. Yeah, like, come what, through of love. Yeah, that's what that's what I grew up on. So I grew up on like mean chaos in my reality TV shows. And I think that and definitely- And mean chaos as well. We've, we've watched <laughs> a lot of New York make her way years after the fact on social media. Oh yeah, exactly. So I think that like, that's always my perspective going in. So when things happen that I start to see criticism for, like for this episode or for like some stuff that happened in Survivor AU that's going on right now, like I don't have that sort of immediate negative reaction to things like that because I don't know, for me, like it's just par for the course. Like I understand there was a strategic reason behind it because they didn't want her to play the shot in the dark. So at least strategically, there's some justification for it. It did feel a little bit like a pile on, but for me, I didn't really have a negative reaction to it. I was just kind of like, yeah, that's reality TV. <laughs> like I, I want to see people play that way. Yeah. I like, I don't mind it. I don't mind the directness. I don't mind the harshness. I don't mind the fighting. Like I saw a comment on Reddit about this tribal council where someone said, this feels like watching people who the first, like for a first time in a long time, watching people interact who genuinely do not like each other. And I'm kind of here for for that i'm i like rupaul's best friend race is not what i want and that's why i think i'm really enjoying this season because i i want to see people fight like i like it <laughs> mm. yeah, and i don't i don't think anyone was like totally out of hand here like i i don't really look poorly upon anyone on the yanu tribe i think that they were frustrated and i i think that they didn't say anything like too personal about her. I think it was all within the confines of the game. So I don't hold anything against anyone on this tribe, but I, I, I'm still watching this. And I actually kind of felt bad, not just for Jess, but for T Tiffany and Kenzie, who are probably getting some negative reaction on social media because of this. But again, they're, they're playing a game. They're playing a game for a million dollars where they don't have food either. So I, I don't blame anyone really personally for this happening. Um, it, but I couldn't, I couldn't help but, but feel a little bit bad. But to Liana's point, this was not i don't think anyone crossed the line here yeah so a couple things on this first uh so jeff had said in the preseason in his interview with rob that like this is the first time in the new era that it finally feels like the players kind of like have control of the game the monster has been domesticated in a way people have gotten familiar with the circumstances enough to be able to plan <laughs> things around them i think what we saw this episode is indicative of that say what you want to about how too cute or hot by half it was for a one out of six shot of having a shot in the dark kid. But like, I do think giving someone a fake idol to make them confident enough to the point where they don't play their shot in the dark is like pretty damn next level in my opinion. And, and I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I guess Jess maybe didn't want to play her shot in the dark anyway, even though she could have technically done both if she really felt like the idol wasn't real, which also would have been hilarious that they went through all this just to have her play her shot in the dark anyway. But the maneuver is really interesting to me because, again, it does feel kind of unnecessary to do, especially at the final 17, though, again, at the final 17, we saw Zach Wurdenberger play his shot in the dark. So I guess you you either want to keep people in the dark, ironically enough, to remove that threat of immunity or you like give them other things to make them feel safe. But in the moment, it's not going to happen. I'm definitely you know I'm, I'm sort of like, in oh, go ahead, Jordan. Yeah, I th I think that there was a one minor moment in this whole the, the this whole like uh, idle gambit, this fake idle gambit that they did that really kind of sold it, and it was when Q was talking to Jess, and Jess even questions, "Is this real?" 
And he's like, kind of like, besides, like, of course, of course it's real. And then he was like, if you don't think it's real, I'll give me, give me, give me it back. And I think the fact that he's asking for it back is maybe what sold it in her mind. Right. Cause then otherwise he would just throw it in. Why would the fire. he, why would he want it? Yeah, exactly. If it's not real, why does he want it? So I do think that was really good. Okay, so one thing I was thinking is maybe once, okay, so you lead her to try to find it. She doesn't find it. Okay, maybe instead of Q giving it to her and saying, you play this, him being like, I will play this on you. Like, I wonder if that would have made it more real because then also she wouldn't have had an opportunity to like look at it too closely. You would like, you show her ah. the paper. You could, <laughs> yeah, I have an idol. Uh, so you show her the piece of paper because that's like real, right? So you can show her the paper and she can be like, oh yes, okay, you found the idol. Like, I believe you. And then you just quickly like, hand wavy you know david blaine show it and then you hide it away and then you say don't worry i'm gonna play it for you i need them to think though that like that because they, they're dead set on voting you but don't worry i got your back like i got your back whatever maybe i wonder if that would have helped the situation to sell it but yeah i mean i mean it you know, works it works anyway, anyway. <laughs> not in the shot in the dark yeah exactly she's not playing the shot in the dark yeah. right and that was what the goal was to accomplish so whatever uh, and and i think that also to, to your point um she doesn't she wouldn't have as much time not just to look at the note but also to inspect the idol which happens to be exactly. Jelinski's beads and i think the cool thing beads, about baby there are very few first boots who had as much of an impact on the second episode as Jolinsky did in, in this episode. He He's coming up at the Matt chat. He's coming oh. up at tribal council. His beads are turning into an idol. Jolinsky might be back on Survivor one day. I am obsessed with how much everyone clowned on Jolinsky. I mean, again, he had such an impact with that seven means several comment at the Matt, which just elicited and i'm sure we didn't get anything from the other two tribes when they came back to camp after that first challenge but like i got to imagine besides their like wtf what's going on with the geckos it's like did you hear what that guy said about how seven means several what's going on there and that could have served as like a nice bonding point for both tribes like oh, genuinely the though because the the fact that both tribes it's like hunter and it's it's um charlie, charlie right that both like clap back at that situation and particularly charlie bringing up well i'm sure there were several reasons why you voted him out like that's so funny that means the, to me that absolutely means that that comment was discussed and this man was discussed because even the fact that hunter was like last name first out like he is living rent free <laughs> in yeah. their heads yeah. Char Which, like, charlie yeah charlie was just so twitter after the premiere with, with that, I know, comments. right? <laughs> so what I will say going back to the Jess situation is that I think my answer probably lies somewhere between the two of you on the spectrum. Here's my hot take. To me, from what I've seen with fake idols in Survivor, it's always punching down. Like, I think, yes, it feels like the case, but let's look back to Jason Siska. Let's look back to Randy. Let's look back to uh to jay from survivor millennials versus gen x in every single instance it's been like oh this person who was already in the minority found this fake thing let's have them play it wouldn't it be funny and so i don't think this is completely new territory and even from an editing perspective i mean again go back to that randy boot episode and they certainly made a meal out of what happened with him i think maybe where the exception comes in is I think whatever you feel about Jess, I think to Jordan's point, like I think Jess was someone who came in again from a very unique perspective, I think representing uh, a certain POV and a certain backstory that I think very much resonates with the fan base, especially given sort of the unfortunate circumstances that have befallen Asian women after Erica has won. And so I do think that I would imagine some of this is colored a bit by the fact that like, okay, I don't like it when it's done to someone like Jess. Uh, but I just think in terms of fake idols in general, I can't really think of someone ever using one to be like, I'm going to give this to the person in charge and then they're going to play it and they're going to be out. It has always been for me something that has made flashy TV, but has always led to the same outcome that would have happened had it not been flashed around. So I am not necessarily mad at like, oh, well, they did it all anyway for Jess to go because that's been deeply seated in Survivor history. And I think the only example I could think where the person on the bottom did this was Devin's when, when he gave the fake idols to, to Julian Lauren. Um, but people, he, he was sort of criticized for that too, because I think a lot of people looked at that and was like, is he trying to make them look dumb? I don't think that was the case. I think Devin's was in a position where he knew that everybody wanted him out of the game. He had his idols, he had his, his challenge wins, so he wasn't going anywhere, but he did. I, I think that's maybe the one case where it wasn't punching down. It was him 
trying to make a show in, in front of the jury as someone who had previously been voted out of the game and 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 knew that like his role was the comic relief and his role was the entertainment for the jury uh, who, who eventually would have voted for him if he had gotten to the end. So I think that's the one situation where it wasn't punching down. Um, I, I do think that there were, I think the, the Randy thing, far better TV and far more entertaining than what we saw in this episode with the fake idol. Well, I think it also doesn't help that those had episodes to build, right? Where it's like, oh, we've mm -hmm. been clowning on Jason Siska for an entire pre-merge, and now he has a stick that looks like an idol. Uh, oh, Randy is someone who's been curmudgeonly and getting into fights. Even someone like Jay had a lot of underdog status, but I think we're rooting for someone like David Wright at that point. I think the fact that this was brought up in episode two doesn't help. That, like, we are still trying to wrap our hands around uh, trying to figure out, okay, what are our opinions on these people? So it's not like halfway through the season, we have either standum or quite the opposite built around these players where it's like, oh, they can do no wrong. As long as they're using a fake idol against these people, they can trick them all they want. Sure. So like if Sari, if Sari had done this to, I don't know, Shane or something, we would have been like, okay, Sari's making a great move. But if Sari had done this to Timbertina, we would have been like, who's this crazy person? Are you talking about Tim Bertina or Suri? I'm, I'm talking about, Timber, <laughs> I'm talking about Sur, Sur, Suri, who's this crazy person who's trying to get Tim Bertina out at the first vote. I do get your point there. I think it makes a lot of sense. But if we, if we didn't know Suri, we would have been like, why is she give, feeding uh, Tim Bertina a fake idol? Yeah, that would have been wild. Uh, Suri yeah. is next level in so many ways. Well, let, let's start continuing to parse our discussion with Jess through some preseason predictions here. Liana's making a face. I'm sorry, they're playing Dropkick Murphys. It's so loud. <laughs> I have a constant thing that says, your mic is muted, your mic is muted, because it's like try it's picking up the noise. And I'm like, I know it's muted. They're just blaring <laughs> shipping up to Boston. I think Charlie got in your ear. Yeah, uh, I know he probably would have wished that Taylor Swift was played at the parade, but he's trying to celebrate St. Patrick's Day in style. Well, I'll, I'll start here then with my prediction. So hopefully they can stop playing the greatest hits of 2007 by the time they pass your window by. Uh, so I will admit, and look, this might color everyone's opinions about my predictions because I had, as I've said for many, many times before, several times, in fact, I had the pleasure of getting to go out there uh, and so I do feel like I had a bit of an unfair advantage in getting to write out these preseason predictions, because not only did I see the first boot in glorious fashion in Jelinski, I also got to get a sense as to like what the dynamics were at each of the tribes. So it would be kind of unfair for me to be like, and this is how exactly the rest of the season is going to go. So I kept two constants the same in my boot order. I had Jelinski going first and I had Tevin as my winner, because that was the guy I clocked as soon as I sat down with him. Everything else, I randomized. I simulated a boot list, and then I just try to fill in the blanks from there. Luckily, the gods of fate were on my side, because I did have Jess going in the preseason, pre-jury, I should say. She nearly went in the preseason if she passed out from lack of sleep. <laughs> uh, here's what I had to say about Jess. I said, when Yanu wins their next challenge in Earn Splint, again, this is me talking from the perspective of post-episode one, where I'd seen Yanu had won zilch up to that point. When Yanu wins their next challenge in Earn Splint, Jess is able to get some rest and her brain is less addled, dot, 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 but not much. Feeling on the outs, Jess attempts to worm her way in socially, and for what it's worth, the women bring her in as a solid vote to take the majority of the tribe. Jess gets sent on a journey where, Brandon style, she has to solve a puzzle in a certain amount of time. Once again, she fails. After once again being the only one, the one standing at the end of a losing challenge effort, Jess gets into a tiff-tiff, accusing her of treating her too harshly in response to their losses. Unfortunately, Q and Kenzie take Tiffany's side. As a result, the person who only watched 80% of TV shows gets voted out about 20% into the season. Also, Jess gets lost walking out of tribal council. I said her closest ally was Kenzie and her enemy was Puzzles. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's so funny. That's, I mean, that's really accurate. Like genuinely. I mean, I understand you had a little bit of an advantage, but even that being said, like I thought that that was really good. I'm Thank very you. impressed. All right, well, Liana, with the house band behind you, why don't I you know. read off your prediction? They're playing the exact same song again. <laughs> Drop <-tick laughs> so again. They're going, yeah. they're going full, they're doing the full well, Murphy. I mean, I guess, okay, the, so, there, are there really any St. <laughs> Patrick's Day songs besides Dropkick Murphys? Yeah, all the other, Patrick's all Day. the other Irish songs. It's like that, Flogging Molly, and I think that's about it. Um, Danny so, Boy. Okay. Is it, yeah. 
<laughs> okay. Yeah. So for context, the St. Patrick's Day Parade is happening and we have like, we're in the staging area. So everybody is out here practicing. So that's why we're not like part of the actual parade where it goes by. They just mm-hmm. sit here and do this for hours. You, until you it sound starts. like you're reporting from like the sidelines of the Thanksgiving <laughs> Day Parade. We're out here. Coming to you and live we have the New Haven, <laughs> Connecticut, St. Patrick's Day Parade. Yeah. Back to um, you, okay. Mike. Back to you, Mike. Well, no, not back to you, Mike, yet, because I need to give my prediction. So um, look, as a uh, neurodivergent girly, I was very excited to have Jess, and I was really excited and very optimistic. So um, this is going to be very wrong. I had Jess making the finale. (laughs) Yeah, I was trying to manifest this to happen. Um, So I said that Jess would create close bonds with Kenzie and Tiffany, making them all palm frond hats. Mm. So specifically, their name is the PFH gang, (laughs) the palm frond hat gang. What up? Okay, so together, the three women take out the men on the tribe and go to merge as a tight threesome. Jess's quirkiness and search for playing with someone fun leads her to create a close bond with Tevin. But when Tevin wins immunity at final five, Jess must be sacrificed to weaken that duo and remove a winner threat. Ah. I also said that Jess would win two individual immunities thanks to her puzzle skills. (laughs) Her enemy is not puzzles, apparently. (gasps) Nope. Puzzles lay down Um, for her like lovers. Right. Right. Uh, so I said that her ally was Tevin and the PFH gang. What up? <laughs> Enemies were Maria slash jealousy from the PFH gang. So All right. that's so, jealousy. Oh, the PFH game. There was a little bit of uh some they were discord seed there. They were uh yeah, they played a big role in my uh <laughs> prediction. So to have one of the PFH gangs go early, that's gonna mess a little few things up. But you know what? We saunter on. Yeah. So, so, okay, Liana, I, I will say that you, your, your prediction was, was wildly off, but I do like the confidence of coming into the game saying to me, I'm going to, this is going to be very wrong. You knew it going in. This is not a blind side, Liana, that Mike is going to get my, my vote here. Um, Mike, you, you did talk about Yanu winning challenges. So that was a point <laughs> against you. I was uh, a hopeless romantic from that perspective. Liana maybe yeah. wasn't ironically enough. <laughs> and look, I said, I said that I, I felt bad for Jess here, but the, the image, this, this, like, uh, this, uh, you know, false fix this, this false narrative of her making hats for everybody is something that would have been fun if it happened so i at least have that image in my mind but mike does get my vote here sorry liana but i think you knew yeah you've been you've been new you've been I, you, yeah, I, you yeah, dirk I been new i dirk been new yeah. you've been you new <laughs> yeah um i i love jess again such a unique personality i thought she was super funny i am disappointed that she wasn't able to make the palm from hat so i think they had much bigger fish to fry in multiple ways that unfortunately and i think also at the same time jess had every intention to and then the second that she like realized these people do not want to work with her she's like ah, screw you i'm not making you a hat get get the twins on the amazing race because i think that would be a lot of fun to see jess and her and her identical twin who's been very active on twitter oh, I, thought I don't know about, if that's I thought, about, I thought you were talking about mariah and liz in terms yeah of i twins. did too. That, that that could also <laughs> be a thing maybe we do a full survivor season it's like survivors survivors slash survivor lookalikes and then also some survivors and their identical twins so we have <laughs> jess and her twin <laughs> on the like a quarter <laughs> blood versus water sure i don't know if the amazing race is necessarily the best game for someone who famously gets lost a lot and loses things but i would love to see it i think that she and her sister have a great dynamic on social media they really do i am in love with justina chong and all things chong speaking of i mean mariah and liz it's interesting because i think on the one hand maybe some people attributed the extended length of the episode to like why are we spending so much time at the challenge from my perspective a I thought maybe on the first watch Liana to your point maybe not on repeat viewings that like the consistent back and forth was absolutely wild And then also them being able to include the extended match chat, which was so much fun. And then the little edits where as these people are like dragging themselves through the sand and absolutely falling apart at the seams, Mariah and Liz being like, oh, you dip Oreos in peanut butter too? And just having that moment where they of all people have to connect with each other on the bench. (laughs) They've moved on to ACDC now. So if anybody cares about. What song? uh the the one from the it's a long way to the top whatever that one is if you want to rock and roll Oh, from school of rock yeah from yes exactly so ben would be very familiar i'm sure of his his own school of rockness mr Mr. um, would love this 
<laughs> the uh yes the liz mariah that moment on the bench where they're so i love the framing of it too they're yeah. so far apart <laughs> on other sides of the bench on the other sides of the screen and they're having like the most awkward but cute conversation it was mwah, chef's kiss I love your socks. I uh, what was I love your socks and I love your something else. There was something else about uh, uh, glasses. Glasses Liz has the, okay. the, the, has the one and only the Liz. The one and only Liz was truly the one and only. To be honest, I know that the rules no longer allow this, thanks to Claire. I want Liz to sit out every challenge because she was. She would be like if Banu had set out a challenge where she was singing the Nami song the entire time, and they were up there for a while, so you knew. That was, you know what? Liz was the dropkick Murphys. She was the marching band outside the window, consistently playing. There was the stuff with Mariah. Uh, yes, you can. And then when Nami wins and she runs up and just screams in their faces, it was, again, this cast is incredibly unhinged. And this is just a slice of that. The person who's sitting out the challenge is bringing the most energy to this is so much fun. <laughs> And before Jeff Probst called that uh, the the Nami tribe did not originally win when they wrote Pizrinstance instead of Persistence, before Jeff Probst made the call that they did not get it right, she's on the bench going, "No, it's not right." <laughs> she's she, I don't think she's allowed to say it. She's probably I guess she's allowed to cheer for Nami, but if you're sitting out, you probably can't yell out like the result of a of, of a word scramble or whatever. But she is saying, "No, no, no." She's waving it off. So she made the call before Jeff. Oh my god! I didn't notice that until my second viewing today. <laughs> so I I should mention here and look, this will officially be the last time I'll talk about being out on set. But this was this spare piece of non episode one stuff that I did get to experience because this was the challenge that I got to run when when I saw them hauling those geckos. I was so happy that I didn't have to run it because look, these people have been through the ringer. Even the most well-fed Namians among us like, are still living out on Survivor for five days at this point. And listen, we did not have an easy time running this challenge. I can get into it. We had a considerably easier time than these three tribes. We were the moto compared to the Ravu of Survivor Fiji. Truly the haves. How hard was it to spell, like not the actual spelling part, but like the holding of the blocks? Like how challenging was that to do? So yeah, I can, I can talk through my experience a little bit here. So the challenge, first off, it's really fun to see. We ran a rehearsal of the challenge, which is done with the Dream Teamers. And this is where they workshop things as well. So it's done for camera staging, but it's also is done for the challenge team to sort of work through it. What's interesting is like, it was fun to watch what, ultimately got cut or changed between versions that we did. For instance, in the version that we did, uh, you were supposed to take apart the wagon at the end and use the bed as kind of like your table to solve the puzzle or to like have a little bit of a wall so that people can't see what you're doing. That ultimately didn't make the, the cut. They said, let's just do it on the ground. But basically, we start out in a pretty disastrous position. First off, really, our follies began from the moment that these teams were chosen uh, because it was myself and Dalton Ross got to go out on set together. And John Kierhofer's like, OK, uh, why don't we have you two guys be together on one of these tribes? And these are, again, like five person tribes. And so we are two of the male representatives. The Dream Teamers, I've mentioned them before, are these people, lovely, lovely young people in their early to mid 20s and these guys are jacked and these guys are strapping and athletic and then the people representing the testosterone on the orange tribe are the goobers we're the goon <laughs> squad and so we got off to a big deficit early on uh dalton was on the machete and these people, as much as we didn't struggle on the challenge as much as they did, we struggled much more on the machete. Uh, watching like Hunter and Jem and Q just tear through that rope, it took a lot of wax. It took a lot of wax to get our rope to go off. We finally do. We we're considerably behind at this point. Then we grab the wheels and you have to pin the wheels in. And one of our pins is bent. We can't actually physically get the wheel in and so they have to like pause the challenge they have to send someone in with a hammer from the art department to just like hammer it into the right place so by the time we actually really start the challenge basically everyone's already at the end and so we're just like eff it we ball uh so you know we're trying the best we can i 
went ahead jet style and just threw all the sandbags and all the barrels to the side on the opposite course. I'm like, screw this. I'm going to go beast mode at this point. I remember walking by Jeff and Jeff sort of mutters at me like, eh, you're still in it because I was looking over and something we benefited from was the fact that uh, we did not have the learning curve of having to figure out what word it might be. We didn't necessarily have Venus on our tribe. We didn't need to because all we happened when we finally got to the end was we were looking at the words that these people were spelling out and we saw persistence. Great. That's what we need to do. To answer your question, Liana, I mean, the first step was, and one of the reasons why I, I don't fault Yanu as much about the whole, or, or, or even Nami about the pessimistance thing, was that it has to be the same on both sides. And so because persistence has multiple S's, uh, multiple E or multiple vowels, for instance, like you gotta pick the right combination. And even then, the other two tribes had really, much like we typically do, read things from left to right and decided to build it as such. So they started with the P and just decided to create the word one letter at a time. Before the challenge, I was like, no matter what time we get there, we have to build from the outside in because that's how an arch is built. Every stone relies on the one that's next to it. And then we put the keystone in the middle. And so because of that, we were able to catch up remarkably and it's that strategy that got us barely by a nanosecond a second place win like we legitimately finished our puzzles at the same time and we happened to get to the mat like a split second before ironically enough the purple group for us to squeak out a win so holding the blocks was not necessarily that bad it wasn't excruciating because we had already sort of figured out the plan and map things out. And we had, I think more of a sound building strategy where we tried to keep everything in line where yes, it was a little bit tense by the end. And there were a couple of us in the middle trying to like hold things up, but we did not experience nearly as many difficulties as these tribes, but I am not necessarily demeaning them with any of that. Strategic yeah. King, Mike Bloom, Dalton Ross, figuring it out, beat out all the, the 20 year old muscle bros and it was mind. You, you could always, you, you can't always beat him with these, but you could always beat him with these. So refield strategy, baby. Mike and Dalton and the rest of your team did. Congratulations, Mike. Mike wins immunity. Oh, well, listen, I have to give so much credit to the dream teamers that we were running with as well. Like they had nerves of steel and they were such great workhorses where they also were like, um, and they do this sometimes when other people run the challenges alongside them. They're like, you guys are going to solve the puzzle. Uh, that happened the last time when I was out there for 39. And so it's like, a lot of pressure on us, but we we were able to do it because of the physical efforts that they put forth. And we were, we were there. We, we helped as much as we could by the end. <laughs> and the art department fixing your your little spiky thing for the wheel. <laughs> well, I so to that point, um, I did celebrate at the end because it was like epic. And I'm not like proud of this. I was a little, I was a little jervousy where after we won, I was wow. like, Bent pin who? Bent pin who? And I just started like, I crowed for like three seconds. I allowed myself to have that moment of celebration. And then I'm like, okay, crap. All right, this is great. Let's, yes. let's all celebrate together. Bent Trash pin. talk. Trash talk. Let them have it, Mike. <laughs> you earned it. Oh my God. So that was an incredible amount of fun. And again, all the shout outs to not only these dream teamers that get to run this challenge, Again, think about the fact that they had to run this. They had to run the Gecko Challenge, like, absolutely ridiculous. Oh, they're exhausted. Yeah, but then also Very to, cool. you know, the, the challenge department for building this stuff. Again, it's, it's something as simple as, like, changing up this puzzle into this giant arch that leads to just such an epic conclusion where it really was a wild, wild outcome of all these tribes dropping their blocks and nobody really figuring out a strategy until they were able to piece something together. You know, it's too bad that Jess's husband wasn't at the, on the Yanu tribe because as someone from St. Louis, he would have known how to build an arch. <laughs> <laughs> is that... Is, There's the same... The, 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 gateway, like, the gateway arch? No, I mean, I know. No, 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 no. We, we understand there. the land national yeah, landmark. We, yes. no, 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 we get it. Is it like, oh, you're from Chicago. You know about beans, baby. <laughs> yeah, so you could build a bean. If I'm from New York, I yeah. could build... If there was a repl replication of the Empire State Building, I'd be able to build that better than a non-New Yorker, I think. I, I see it sometimes. 
Yeah, but they weren't there for like the creation of the art. I this was not a this is not a real suggestion, Mike. I, I think like, I actually let's, think that. <laughs> let's tear apart Jordan's joke. Like, let's yeah. just dig into it, baby. Yeah, <laughs> I you... I do. Yeah, I do have something to dig into regarding oh, this challenge. Absolutely. I have if if I'm allowed a mini game for the two of you guys to play regarding something that happened in let's this challenge, it. if that's okay. Yes. Okay. Well, it is March. Oh, no, I skipped it on my rewatch. <laughs> um, no, it's it, no, no, no. The challenge, having watched the challenge, does not matter. This isn't uh, like a, oh, who okay. is third to step on the mat. Yeah, no, it's not. Sure. It's not. <laughs> this is not. Tri this is not trivia. Uh, I know I normally do trivia. This is not trivia. So this, I. It is March. It is bracket season officially. Uh, March Madness coming up pretty soon. I have my seeds, baby, and I have a little mini. March Madness tournament for the two of you guys to uh, to figure out. So here's what we're gonna do. We had the Yanu tribe. Oh, sorry, sorry, the Nami tribe, right? Because for instance, on the, on their puzzle instead of persistence, they did end up winning the challenge. So didn't didn't end up biting them in the butt. But there have been many cases in Survivor history where there have been some funny misspellings. So this is going to be the Survivor misspelling bracket. Uh, there are only eight contenders here, so it's going to be a pretty short bracket. Is the is the uh, C and K switched in bracket? Uh, the C and the K, yes, is is switched in bracket. The uh, it's the B, it's B, it's the Barack, it's the Barocket. Uh, the March Madness misspelling Barocket. Well, I have a million um, reasons to love this. Only six hundred thousand by the time Barocket is done with it. Yeah. So let let's start with the left side of the bracket here. So the there are two there are two sides. The left side are all misspellings from challenges. Okay. So yeah. let's start with the first one. Here's how it's going to work. You're going to vote for the one that you want. If you both vote the same, that uh, advances. If you are tied, I'll break the tie. Let's see what happens. So we have, of course, this is a famous one. We have the Ben upside down you in the Heroes Healers Hustlers challenge. He had uh, the, the you looked like an N, so it was like Hustlers or whatever, or however you would pronounce that. We have the Ben upside down you versus Dan Foley, who instead of outwit, outplay, outlast on his puzzle, he had he wrote out what abla outlast. <laughs> Sounds like a foreign exchange student. <laughs> those <laughs> this, are to this is what it looks like. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like so, like to me, both those are pretty iconic. I think the Dan Foley one I see more like used more often. So I feel like if if like that one has persisted uh, further. Good. Uh I I might make this first one a tie because I Ooh. think for me, it's less so about like that was iconic and it also gets associated with Dan is wrong and Dan is wrong again. I do think the Ben moment, I mean, led to him almost losing the game. Like if that you is an upside down and if the fire making twist doesn't exist as it shouldn't, then he ends up losing because of it. I also am like cheating a bit because I would assume that there's another Worlds Apart misspelling in here that I like more and I don't want to necessarily as you would do with any sort of survivor bracket, fill this with too much worlds apart. Okay. Well, I will say this is going to be the only worlds apart uh, uh, on here. Okay, what is it? What is it? I, I did this pretty quickly. Like before, I did this this morning. <laughs> so I could have Well, isn't there uh, the infamous challenge, another challenge that they, they basically like stagnated on at the final six of the like reward shaint fix wishing. That could have been on here too, but I, I did go with the Ben, the, the Ben upside down you over the shaint. Okay. Uh, so then in that case, then, can I change my vote? Can I bonu it and get up and start changing things around? I'll give it to uh, Utslot. Okay, so uh, Utslot, Utslot, is going to be the winner. Dan Foley Ooh, moves what? on in <laughs> in the bracket. So Dan Foley is going to the semifinals. Now we have our other uh, our other two uh, challenge misspellings. We have the one that we just spoke about, Prisristance by the Nami Drive, against uh, all the way back in season seven, a, a man named Burton once misspelled the word liaison. liaisons jeff probes called that the challenge was over but then they had to bring everyone back and they said that no uh burton you forgot the second i in liaison you spelled it wrong so we'll start with mike this time are you going with position uh, or lia 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 liaison well uh well i love talking with a lia liaison in liana uh <laughs> you know i think they really could have used liz out there in the pearl islands being like no it's not right burton stop it you don't need the sword uh, I'm going to go with, I'm going to go with Pezzerid since it's a little bit of recency bias, but like the fact that five adult people were not clocking the spelling mistake as much as again, I do not lay any blame onto them for like struggling with this challenge more than like one guy who forgot there was a second vowel in liaisons. That to me is the much bigger deal. 
Okay, and Liana, are you going? Yeah. Resistance, resistance or Liazon? Oh, man. Okay, so I'll tell you I was leaning towards Liazon. Um, but mainly because it was like, oh, well, they had they like called the challenge, thought claimed that he won, came back, had to restart, like redo the challenge. Like that's pretty intense and pretty iconic. But from a humor perspective, I think the argument of persness nonce or whatever is like is just funny. Like I would similarly misspell liaison. So what would you have said, Jordan? <laughs> Well, you're, so you're both going with Pizristance. I, I think I would have agreed with Pizristance. And for the reason that liaison yeah. is is a hard word to spell, I could see it yeah. being spelled like that. Pizristance <laughs> is nothing. <laughs> and I think that's the good thing about the Dan Foley one as well. Like, how did he think that that was how you were going to solve that challenge? So um, as the, uh, the great Dwight Moore's good friend once said, nevertheless... We persistence and persistence moves on. <laughs> <laughs> moves on to the uh, again. I'm, I'm I'm absolutely loving these lily pads that you're hopping across of like connecting Dwight and his political experience to nevertheless she persisted to nevertheless she persisted. Yes, nevertheless, the, put that put that on a shirt. <laughs> I'm gonna get that framed in my I house. Would buy, oh, this is I would buy the picture, that. I would the buy picture that. of Dwight drinking the smoothie. Nevertheless, she persisted. She <laughs> what a very weird niche inside joke. It's perfect. I love yeah. it. I'm a talk, talk about shirts that go hard. That it starts a conversation. Right it's a conversation hard. starter. They're like, "What's going on?" You're like, "Do you have several minutes?" <laughs> this will sit down. Get a drink. This will take a while. All right, so we have we have our two. We have Dan Foley and Pizzer Insurance going to going to the, uh, the the finals of the bracket. We're not we're going to leave that one alone for a little bit. Let's go to the right side of the bracket. These are not going to be challenge moments. These are going to be votes at Tribal oh. Council, and we are going to start with um, a pretty famous one versus one that I always thought was funny that doesn't really get talked about so much. So the famous one, maybe one of the most fam maybe the most famous misspelling in uh, Survivor history on a vote. We have Sue's vote for Sonia at the very first tribal council in Survivor history, where she wrote Sauna, S-O-U-N-A. And that is going against a vote in Survivor Token Chains at the final four, where JT is trying to vote for Taj, but he votes for Tag. <laughs> I've just I've cheese. always been I've always been tickled by this one and it never gets talked about, so I put it on the bracket. You're it. Uh I, it, no, it's gotta be Sue. For me. Yeah, it's uh, gotta be it too for me as well. Again, this was I think one of the first votes shown in Survivor history mm -hmm. as well, Shona. Uh, and I think as well, it also I also had always had some headcanon that like Sue was trying to will because was, this was the first season of Survivor and, and they thought they could talk to the producers like this of like, yeah, you know, I, we're missing the creature comforts already. Like, can we get a sauna in here? Can I write out my order for you, sauna, please? <laughs> Yeah, so Sue, that's that is a good conspiracy theory that Sue thought that it was it, it was like her her uh, a menu and she had some things that there she that she could get. Yeah, um, I I think that is plausible, Mike. Uh, so Mike votes for sauna. Uh, Liana, where are you going? Yeah, I agree. I I cosign. I think also because it's like just that that series because doesn't she have a bunch of like misspelled votes oh also? yeah all, all so, her like, all her votes oh, yeah. all her yeah votes. exactly i could have so done i, I could have done a a, a, a sue hawk bracket, sue hawk bracket. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. if and when she comes back i think we'll we'll make a podcast about that yeah for sure but put, put it on an out list um okay and so sound, sound of moving on of course against i, I do love the tag one 100 would have voted for sue if one of you for, had, for some reason had voted <laughs> against Sue Hawk there. Uh, and, and I, I knew that nothing, I, I knew that it would be very hard to find one to beat Sauna. So I had to put my weakest one against that. One of these two can maybe beat out Sauna. We have, this is going to be the Philip Shepard round because we have one of Philip Shepard's votes in his first ever tribal council, where he both misspelled Francesca's name and said Francesca. And then he also wrote I don't know if I could read this word because there's one letter in here that I can't tell if it's a Z or oh, a cross out. I thought you were saying like, uh, said something a little R rated. No, 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 no. He's, he said he, he did write an F word incorrectly, but it was Frank, either Frank Z squa or Frank cross out Esqua. So I don't know which one it was, but cross he clearly did not know what her actual name was. Um, so Fra Frank Z squa is going against a vote that was cast for Philip Shepard. 
This is Philip Shepard's only jury vote uh, at the Redemption I Island Final Travel Council. Of course, cast by Ralph Kaiser, who is the only rival to Sue Hawk in terms of misspellings at, uh, on votes, where he wrote file, P-H-I-L-E. See, my other conspiracy theory is I think Ralph was actually spoiled about Survivor Philippines and was casting a vote for the winner there. Um, <laughs> That's that's uh, yeah. I I ended, I can see where you went. I see where you went there. <laughs> that's um, my lily pad. <laughs> yeah, uh, Mike Scoopin is someone whose name has been spelt wrong as S K O O P I N before. But we are. Going I mean, with... I believe that was also the only jury vote for him as well. Yes, that is true. But I went with file here. I didn't want to scoop it anywhere on this bracket. Now he's being talked about. So we have file and Frank Zisqua. Which one are you going with, Liana? Yeah, I think it's got to be Frank Z Squa or whatever. Um, I think maybe I'm being biased with also the pronunciation, like in that actual tribal council as well. So then the the vote being a representation of the mispronunciation, like totally fits. Like it's complete canon. Well, listen, let's make things interesting here. I'll tie it up because uh, I do think, obviously, to Liana's point, there's a long tail, or maybe this is the tail of Francesca, concerning that the entire tribal council was Philip with his full chest trying to say his her name in vain. But I think the fact that Phil is by far the most inex inexcusable spelling of this entire conceit. Like, Phil is a normal enough name. You have probably come across many fills in your life. There's no instance where there's just a random E at the end of it. Like, the E is not silent from this perspective. There's not, like, fillet or anything like that, even though he was pretty much filleted at the final tribal council. There is no reason in the history of the English language since we first put uh, chisel to stone Hundreds of thousands Mike, of years Mike, ago. Mike Chisel to Stone. Exactly. Who also voted at the Tribal Council that you would want to spell Phil P H I L E. There is no reason why. And so, for just the pure absurdity of the situation, I'm going to give it to Ralph here. Okay. So, I, I have a decision to make. I love both of these. Uh, Liana, I do agree with you that French G Squad, that Tribal Council, and the misspelling or the mispronunciation of French G Squad's name uh, is more iconic than the misspelling of uh, Ralph Kaiser's name. But this is the misspelling bracket, not the mispronunciation bracket. And I do think that the Can't worst wait for that one next season. <laughs> the, the worst misspelling, because of the reasons that Mike gave, it's such an easy name to spell. I am going to go with file. And I do think that maybe Philip could have, I mean, he clearly didn't know how to pronounce her name, but I do think he was spelling it the way he had mispronounced it so many times because he was mad at Francesca. And it, I, I do think just as a misspelling, I'm going to go with file. And I do think it makes sense to have Sue versus Ralph Kaiser in, yeah. in the fine in, in the, uh, uh, the championship round of that region. So let's go now back to the challenges. We have Dan Foley's outro trip verse. I can't even say it. You can't you can't pronounce any of the words. Don't bother. Yeah, they're puzzle. not. It's not. Yeah. Against Prizrishnish. I mean, we're gonna call it the winner of the of the matchup because that's what it is. I mean, all all the best to Pesristins, but uh, it's the new kid on the block. It it needs some time. Uh, out with out twat out Ufla has been marinating for quite some time, much like the Survivor auction itself, and like the auction which. Hasn't popped up since Survivor 30, with the exception of last season. It's been a long time since we've had a challenge misspelling on that level, including what we saw this episode. Yeah, I'm going in the same direction as Mike here. So Dan Foley going to the finals, baby. We're doing it. Dan Foley is at the end. Out, so what out he could not actually do on the island. He finally <laughs> does here. Out, 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 pla. And is it going to outwit, outplay, outlast the winner from the other side of the bracket? We have File versus Sauna. So this is tough. This is like um what, when you're going through one of these brackets and it's like, it's like the AFC, you know, conference championship. Like, well, one of these teams is probably going to win the Super Bowl. So we kind of got the Super Bowl a week early. I feel like if this was a three-way matchup at the end, drag race season 10 style, that would be more interesting. But I do have a feeling that whoever wins this is going to win the whole thing. I'm going with Sue Hawk on this one with because I think for me, what a trailblazer to be spelling incorrectly so early for a season. I, 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 that's where my gut is telling me to go. I'm going to agree. Listen, I'm going to, I want to honor Sue Hawk every chance that I can get. So I'm going to grab this opportunity and not let go. 
Yeah, there, there is there is no more iconic uh, tribal council misspeller than than Sue Hawk. So I do think it is fitting that Sue Hawk is in the finals of the misspelling bracket. But now, Mike, you predicted that uh, Sauna would uh, defeat Dan Foley. Uh, so we, I think I know where your vote is going. You're 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 yeah, you your I, shot. I, I think we should do what Mother Nature intended and let the Sue eat the Dan. Okay, and uh, Liana, do you agree? I want to make it interesting. Ooh, oh, okay. so I'm going to make it a me. tie. And there is a logic behind it, apart from just wanting to make it a tie, because I'm going in from a meme perspective. And I'll tell you what I see used more often, and it is the misspelling of Ooble Oub- Outlet Lib Nob. So for me, <laughs> that's what I'm going with. And I really, I I'm, I'm would be happy with either one of these winners. So I want to see, Jordan, where you end up okay. giving the win. I'm pretty sure I've been called the Lib Knob a couple of times when I post about the diversity initiative. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <The> lib Knob. <laughs> that's what the casuals call you on Facebook. <laughs> yeah, I, I am, I'm torn here because the reason we're doing this bracket is because of his restaurant. Uh, which was on the the left side of the bracket. We're doing this because of the misspelling at a challenge. But can I vote against Sue Hawk here in a bracket, in the March Baracket misspelling competition? So we have Dan Foley with his puzzle spell misspelled three of the most iconic words in Survivor. It's the only words besides like the title of the season on the logo besides Survivor. And we mm. have Sauna a vote cast at the first ever tribal council in survivor history. You have both made valiant points. You, uh, you both reasoned out your decision. Well, but I feel like I'm going to have a crazy trucker yelling at me on the beach. a la Kelly Wigglesworth. If I don't go with sauna here. So sauna <laughs> wins the bracket. That was probably my number one seed going in. I had a feeling we would get there, but I wasn't sure very good reasons. And I think that that Sue Hawk and sauna uh, deserve this one. Yeah. There we go. Uh, the check is made out to you, Sue. It's spelled S O O, and see if you can cash it. Yeah, let's let's bring let's bring Sue Hawk. I, I I think we could have like an Island of the Idols type, like Sue Hawk in the little voting booth, and she has to guess how every single name is spelled just to to get her out there again. I, I prefer if Sue Hawk and Island of the Idols were not in the same sentence due to various reasons. <laughs> yeah, that's actually a good. <laughs> <laughs> didn't think about that one but uh yeah yeah let's but uh, okay let's let's get Sue Hawk back on survivor and not mention the other season for obvious reasons <laughs> from your mouth to god's ears yeah. as we turn to the goddess of the B&B Liana what do you have you have something in store for us this Ooh. week oh boy do i so look we had and we talked about this we had two hours of glorious survivor content and so i wanted to make the most of that and pull what i deemed to be some pretty iconic quotes but the catch here is you're not going to hear the full quote because we are playing what the bleep classic big brother game we all love (laughs) as we all know so (laughs) what i've done is i've gone through and i have pulled survivor clips and i have bleeped out one or two words and i'll tell you uh whether or not it's one or two words and so the way that this game is going to work is you're going to go back and forth hear a clip and then try to guess two things one who said the clip and two, which should be a gimme point, I hope, for both of you. Um, and then also what the word is that was bleeped out. And then we will play the answer and see if you're correct. Okay. So does everybody understand the game? Yes. I'm excited. Lovely. Like yes. Okay, great. As the band serenades us <laughs> from outside, <laughs> we will What's, what, song, what song is on the jukebox now? Um, I don't know. Oh, trying to hear. Oh it. wait, no, it's Chumba Wumba. Oh, <laughs> that classic <laughs> Irish dirge. <laughs> well, they played, they played the that Dropkick Murphy song. They're like waking up in Bo- what? What's the Ship, song? Shipping up, up to Boston. Ship, shipping up yeah. to Boston. So they played that like eighteen thousand times. They played the Pretenders, um, the I Will Walk Five Hundred mm. Miles song. Yeah. They played the, the AC. I will walk five hundred miles, but just down your up and down <laughs> oh, your street, yeah. not yeah, off, not away from your apartment at you all. You think that should have been playing? Because we're in a very musical season. Should that have been playing? during the sweat challenge for Jelinski and Q. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, they I need, will walk 5,000 miles, but I won't be because yeah. I'll give up halfway. Yeah. The, the Jelinski, well, I mean, the Jelinski I, version of Shumbawamba is I get knocked down and I don't get up. And again. I stay <laughs> down. Oh, and I'm not getting back up. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay, 
Great. So while they play a weird cover of Chumbawamba outside, let's get into our first clip. So Mike, this one is going to be for you. So I have shared clips with the wonderful Mike Bloom. He will be playing them. Let's kick things off. They all think I'm just, you know, the happy-go-lucky country guy who's just having a good time out here camping. But the reality is I'm here to f*** hard. Okay. Wow. Well, uh, we're getting freaky right from the beginning here. So the person that's speaking is Hunter. Uh, I don't think there are many people that can describe this self as, like, lovable country guy. Uh, I will say, I mean, I'm just going to go Occam's Razor here. I'm just going to say, he, did he say play hard? All right. Let's see if you're correct. All right. Uh, let me see if I can. Let me see if I can find it. Uh... They're in order. They're I in know. the folder. They are numbered in exactly the order you need they did, to play they them. They didn't get loaded in order. That's the problem. Uh, All right. <laughs> I got. It. I got it this time. Here we go. They all think I'm just, you know, the happy-go-lucky country guy who's just having a good time out here camping. But the reality is, I'm here to play hard. There we go. Easy, easy peasy. Exactly. You are correct. Yes, he what was there to play hard. <laughs> I guess I'm here to work hard. I, 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 yeah, I think I, I would have gone with the same thing, Mike. Imagine, imagine if that wasn't the case. Yeah. I know, right? Uh, okay, so I'm here to, Jorgen. I'm here to Jelinski hard. <laughs> That's what he just... should have said. <laughs> uh, which is to fold, of course, as we know, at the first sign of opposition. Mm -hmm. Okay, Jordan, you are next. Yes. Jungle Jam! Oh! Jungle Jam! We got him! I love Jungle Jam. It's, it's, it's Jungle Jam, but it's also like Jungle Jam. It's like a. <laughs> Okay, so Early. That, that, well, I, yes, I, I knew. <laughs> you did give it away, Mike, but that is, I knew that was, that was Charlie. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> I, I, I knew, I just, I just watched the episode. I knew that was Charlie. <laughs> David, I forgot for some reason that part of the challenge is to say who said it. And that I is the easier part of this game. The person who said it. Can I, can I hear it again, Liana? Because it's, it, it, the, it's, the, I couldn't tell if it was the last word or if there was something said after the beep. So I will give you, so yes, play it again. This, this is, there are two words that are okay, said. Okay. Okay. Jungle Jam! Oh! Jungle Jam! We got him! I love Jungle Jam. It's, it's, it's Jungle Jam, but it's also like Jungle Jam. It's like a... <laughs> I believe, and it's good I just watched this. I believe he said double pun. Let's find out if Jungle Jam! Oh! Jungle Jam! We got him! I love Jungle Jam. It's, it's, it's Jungle Jam, but it's also like Jungle Jam. It's like a double pun. <laughs> I love the laugh. <laughs> yeah, the laugh, <laughs> laugh kills it for me. That was the whole reason why I actually pulled the clip was simply because of the laugh. It made me laugh so hard. I also love the logic of Charlie being like, yeah, I know I'm kind of socially awkward. People aren't getting the double puns. You know what's really going to help? If I just sit there and list off 100 plus Taylor Swift songs, that will really endear me to, to the, you know, the the common man. Yeah, and, and not to go too, too all in on Philip Shepard on this podcast, but this episode was so long that we started getting Stealth R Us nicknames. Yeah, I was I was trying to look them up to see if we could uh, break them down because we had Jungle Gem. I remembered Moshetti. For Mariah. Moshe, I, maybe, that's the one I missed on my list. Yes. Uh, well, I will also admit when I was visiting the Sega camp, I had the the nicknames were already out there. I'd heard okay. Jungle Jam and I'd heard Moshetti. Uh, I had heard what was it like General Mom? I think I, it, I have Lieutenant Mambo here. Lieutenant Mambo. That's what I think. Is it Mambo said. the snake from um, Mamba? Uh, Mamba. Oh, okay. But I think it's like mom, M O M B O. That's what unless, I wrote. But I could have heard it here. Maybe. Uh, yeah, so I, mean, I feel like, I feel I feel like Lieutenant... that's not good if you're getting the Shambo comparison. Lieutenant Mom, Charlie is Tarzan, which. Here's the other thing that could have happened. My notes app could have autocorrected to Lieutenant Mambo. <laughs> <laughs> Spell mom. <laughs> I, don't, I mean, I, I assume Sue? I spelled it M O M. Like maybe I spelled M A M. I don't know. No, I think they said Lieutenant Mambo, and I, I apologize to Maria if that is not correct. Who's Papaya uh, Papa? Papaya Papa <laughs> is Tim. Uh, okay, because he was the one that was looking for them. The Tarzan nickname for Charlie intrigues me. Did Charlie crap his pants? <laughs> what? Oh, it was, uh, it was definitely dirt. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, it's not a non sequitur. Yeah. <laughs> it's not Jeff at the opening. Uh, Charlie. Did you crap your pants? I mean, did you crap? What would you do if you crapped your pants? <laughs> yeah. What would you do if you honestly your we were like two questions pants. away from Jeff legitimately yeah. asking that? I would not have been surprised. <laughs> and then uh, Ben is benevolence. Benevolence, which reminds me of like, wasn't was was uh Brenda like Serenity or something? I feel like it's kind of in that that uh, family of weird oh, names. Yeah, something there was some weirdness in South R Us where like there were some yeah. half-assed nicknames and. I, I so I think bene benevolence it makes sense because of because of his name uh being Ben. I feel like I'm I'm now explaining. Oh no, you like are you are totally <laughs> right. Okay, wait. I gotta run through these Nick Dan because But the Charlie Tarzan, fun. why is Charlie Tarzan? Maybe it was something where like I would say that he's okay, he's so accustomed to the land, but like jungle gem's right there, you know? Tar like, Tarzan, he, maybe I'm just thinking that Tarz the Tarzan who played Survivor was a old mustachioed man where like charlie's the total opposite of, of that i i call him like vest boy vest boy vespa yeah I queen, call him vespa queen vespa because i want to ride him uh <laughs> these south Aros nicknames are wild i'm looking at the caramoan ones so to your point jordan Brenda was serenity. She was serenity. Sherry was tenacity. Yeah. Like they just ran out of Benevolence is part is part of this. Like Ben Ben Katzman is now in there. Do you remember any other ones? Um, well, there there was the uh intelligentsia attache, which I believe was Phil himself. No, that was Cochrane. Of course, that Phil was Cochran. That's right. That was Cochrane. He had to stick with the specialist. The specialist, yes. Okay. I didn't know if that was one of his like alternate titles. If he was out in uh you know doing the Costa Rica job and needed to use an alias, he became a intelligentsia attache. Um I'm I'm trying I'm blanking on some of these other these other I'm surprised I remembered Serenity. I feel like if you're doing right. the scorpion quiz, that's like the last one. Yeah, I'll about. I'll go in order of most mundane to most out of pocket. So Andrea mm -hmm. is the eliminator. Okay. Malcolm is the enforcer. Okay. Dawn is true grit. Yes, I do remember that. And Corinne is the dominatrix. Yes, I do remember that. I remember her being the dominatrix. Um Andrea is the eliminator. Mm -hmm. Make makes sense. Even though when I played Fake Survivor with Andrea, I, I eliminated her. Humble brag. Wow, you're the eliminator um, eliminator. No, the, the that's that should be my nickname. Uh, also, Brandon Hans was the conqueror, and Julia was the double agent. Julia was the double agent. She's just <laughs> I, I think of her more as vanilla, but, but okay. <laughs> I don't I don't think Philip would tell her that. Even Cochran would tell her that to her face. Yeah, that's that's confessional only uh, content. All okay, right. now that we're done with that, we're tied, let's baby. go back to my game. <laughs> we're in a game. I forgot we're in a game. The dominators <laughs> of games, Liana Boris. Yes, yes, Jordan. Serenity now. The eliminator. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to eliminate Mike Bloom from this competition. Exactly. All right, double agent Mike Bloom. Let's see what you got for our next clip. In my tribe, I'm going up against some very strong personalities, and I thought that I would be this kind of social butterfly, but I don't know, maybe I've been a little bit more reserved than my normal self. That's why I the ants. So I don't have to talk. Jess. Oh, my. Oh, ooh, I do declare. Oh, clutching my pearls. Someone's betting the ants out there. <laughs> I t uh, there's one thing to become a queen, yeah. but this is ridiculous. All right, let's, yeah. Uh, uh, so and uh, yes, the, I think I know your answer. That's why I ate the ants. Correct. Yes. And I think you did mention Jess. Otherwise, I'm just going to. Did, did you uh, Did you play this clip sped up or did she really talk that quickly out on the island? No, that's she really, these are all regular 1X wow. speed clips. So, yeah. Lack of sleep, maybe? I don't know. Wow. So well, maybe, maybe we cram like two and a half hours into a two hour episode because Jess talks so quickly. I know, right? Well, it makes the clip shorter. That's useful. Um, okay, well, let's just confirm, Mike. Are you right? Did she eat the ants? In my tribe, I'm going up against some very strong personalities. And I thought that I would be this kind of social butterfly. But I don't know. Maybe I've been a little bit more reserved than my normal self. That's why I eat the ants. So I don't have to talk. I loved it. I loved that it. Was, I loved the strategy of, the, of eating ants so you don't have to talk. <laughs> that was one of the quotes I wrote down in my in my notes for this episode. Wouldn't you want to stuff something in your mouth that takes up more space? How many ants are you eating so you don't have to talk? Right, like you're not chewing a long time, right? To like kind of keep your mouth full. But anyway. I would, eat, I would eat sand if that was the case. Ah, I don't recommend that. They're like, who okay. do you think you should vote off? 
<laughs> oh, he said uh, San, San, Sandy, Sandy Bergen. It's always Sandy Bergen. <laughs> always. All right, Jordan, this next clip is for you. Okay. Jeff, we have to rely on each other in these conditions. We don't have anybody else. We have to use each other's resourcefulness. Banu even cut his finger with a machete today just to f*** us. Like, we're you learning mean he to. F- you part of his flesh? <laughs> I wish I really need the protein. <laughs> ah! So I know it's Kenzie. I think I need to hear it again because there's again two two ble- is is the bleep the same word or is it two different words? It's the same word. It's the same word. I think I know what it is, but can I hear it one more time? Jeff, we have to rely on each other in these conditions. We don't have anybody else. We have to use each other's resourcefulness. Banu even cut his finger with the machete today just to f- us. Like we're you learning mean to. F- you part of his flesh <laughs> i wish i really need the protein <laughs> so i believe the first bleep is is feed and the second one is the past tense fed that jeff said yes oh well okay wait never mind play the clip uh, well, we, don't, we don't know we don't know <laughs> jeff we have to rely on each other in these conditions we don't have anybody else we have to use each other's resourcefulness Banu even cut his finger with a machete today just to feed us. Like, we're learning to... You mean he to... fed you part of his flesh? <laughs> yeah, I no. wish I really need the protein. <laughs> All of these quotes would be great for a future uh, Mad Libs on the b and What it the... Was, yeah. What the hell are they talking about? Banu's finger. He 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 cut his finger and then, and then Jeff insinuated that Jess was a cannibal. Yes, exactly. That he cut his finger off and they ate him. I mean... <laughs> I guess I could think of worse sources of food. And I guess if you want to say, like, I will live, die, and bleed for this game. You know, Kathy Sleckman infamously tried to cut off her finger to get out of Survivor. I guess if you, like, take, like, a, a layer off, maybe, where you could survive without getting medevaced, maybe that could work. I, but I feel like you have to really convince people or trick them. Yeah. I feel like it's like donating blood, right? Like, you can give some blood. You can give some flesh. You know, and your body will like scar, regenerate, whatever. So you just gotta like feed little bits of you if you wanna survive. I don't know how well that works for the person who's like losing their flesh. But anyway, yes. So Jordan, you are correct in terms of feed fed. However, that was Jess who said that quote. Well, that was Jess, that wasn't Kenzie. Kenzie, oh, okay. correct. Yes. So Yeah, I don't are... think Kenzie would say, Oh, please, Banu, feed me your flesh. You know what? You know what's funny? I it, when I was talking about it, I said that that Jeff insinuated that Jess was a cannibal. So I in somewhere in there I knew it was Jess, but I did you say knew, Kenzie. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So Mike, let's go back to you. I think that there's plenty of men out there who would want to be with Liz. That's for your Theo first comment. So whether you look at it Well, they want to, but can they? Everybody wants to be with Liz. (laughs) me. Well, is this even a bleep? Like, I feel like so much is even insinuated. No double entendre needed. So obviously Liz is saying that. Okay, I'm going to have to listen for the, the full quote again. I think that there's plenty of men out there who would want to be with Liz. That's for your Theo first comment. So whether you look at it or not. Well, they want to, but can they? Everybody wants to be with Liz. (laughs) (laughs) Can I get a clue as to like how many words this is? One word. One word? Uh, One word. In a season featuring Charlie's uh, named doppelganger. They, everyone wants to be with me. One word, me. <laughs> everyone wants to be with me. Also, which person is he trying to get? I'm... I, I, God, I'm drawing a blank here. I'm going to say... Marry me? Marry me! What, what are you, maybe? <laughs> Marry <Yeah>. me! <laughs> okay. I'm going to go, go with Ding. I think it's Ding. Ding. Okay. Let's play the clip. I think that there's plenty of men out there who would want to be with Liz. That's for your Theo first comment. So whether you look at it. Well, they want to, but can they? Everybody wants to be with Liz. Trust me. (laughs) Uh, That makes sense. 
That makes a lot more sense. It wasn't ding. Yes, it was trust. So we have a score of Mike with five to Jordan's three, but Jordan, you're up next. I've also mentioned, by the way, Liz is just unhinged in the best way. Like, I, sorry, I don't want to distract too much, but like, absolutely wild of a person. <gasps> Remember that she's also still yeah. referencing like all of her businesses and all the money she's making? Oh, yeah. Which I've like, I've, you know, I've seen the conversation about like, oh, well, you know, that way you're not a threat if you get to the the end, right? Because it's like, oh, oh, you know, they're, we're not gonna have to worry about their sob story, like to the jury. But mm -hmm. I just feel like if that's her goal, she's not executing that well. Yeah, Liz, Liz is gonna get to the end and the jury is gonna be like, but her emails. <laughs> Put that on a t-shirt with Dwight also for some reason. <laughs> yeah, it's on the back. <laughs> yeah. Right, come on. There we go. One of Jess and Bono should be the one to go next. So I'm trying to him and keep it positive. So that's Kenzie. <laughs> it's <laughs> I, not <okay>. Jess. <laughs> I, I'm pretty sure it's not Jess. Um, okay, so that's Kenzie. I, I think I'm gonna need to hear it again, though. Okay. One of Jess and Bono should be the one to go next. So I'm trying to him and keep it positive. Certainly keeping it positive, I would say. I'm trying you might test to test positive for something after you do that. Okay. <laughs> I, I eat his flesh. I don't really, I remember flesh her positive. saying this. <laughs> I remember her saying this. I don't remember the actual quote, but I'm going to go educated guess here based on what would make sense in that context. I'm going to say motivate. Okay. Motivate. All right. Dig mo. And the answer. One of Jess and Bono should be the one to go next. So I'm trying to placate him mm. and keep okay. it positive. That works too. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, look, yeah, it was a great guess for the context, but unfortunately the answer was placate, but you did get it right with Kenzie. So you were only one point behind Mike. Now these are the last two clips. So Mike, you're going to have, this is your last one. Let's see if you can keep your lead. I'm living in a universe right now where I am wildly entertained by just two guys just and forth. Struggle with that. So this is two words, right? This is two words, yes. Okay, I think I got it. This is not Liz, but Mariah, with the one with the cool socks. Uh, I believe she said, saying names. Okay, let's see if you're right. Saying names, saying names. I'm living in a universe right now where I am wildly entertained by just two guys just saying names back and forth. Struggle with that. I, I absolutely love that. It really is that. Like, yes, there are songs and music and experiences affiliated with these days, but they really are just saying strings of words back and forth to each other. And it's yeah. a, a, it took up the entirety of their day. <laughs> and also, it's not like you can be on Wikipedia being like, okay, yes, that's correct. That's incorrect. Like, you're just, like, trusting that, yes, they're saying To be fair, Mariah was, was the was the judge titles. to go to on All Too Well versus All Too Well 10-minute version. <laughs> Yeah, which that was interesting because I was like, I don't know if I would have given him that, but it's I also understand, like, because because Taylor, it's like this Taylor's version, like love story, Taylor's version. But, uh, so they're I all Taylor's version, code, but you know, well, oh, anyway, Jordan, it's my personal. You, you don't even know about the true villain that is Scooter Braun. I don't. <gasps> okay, Good so Jordan, but I believe I believe Mike is clinched. By the way, but I'm still gonna go for it. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not quitting. Yes. I'm still gonna go okay. for it. I'm not gonna throw it for like a better draft pick. And the next time I'm on the B and B, I'm gonna try to get it right. Okay, so I will give you a little bit of a hint on this one. This is actually not from the Survivor episode, but Jordan, I believe in you. Is it my seeds okay? baby video? Is that where we're going here? Why, Why would we do that? <laughs> I don't know. Why would it not be from the episode? <laughs> what do you? Well, look, let's just hear the clip and let's see what you think. And the next person voted to be a cutie who sends their friends videos is Well, I'm going to say that that is the great host of Survivor, Jeff Probst. And I've seen this video and I believe that the vote said you and he said you. What do you think, Leah? 
Yeah, yeah, sorry. Let's hear the answer. <laughs> and the next person voted to be a cutie who sends their friends videos is you. Woo! I am obsessed with this. For so many reasons. So first, this is uh, something that was posted on the uh, After Midnight TikTok, I believe, because Jeff made a guest appearance where he also got to appear with Monet Exchange, which was fantastic. But it 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 makes so little sense. <laughs> it's brilliant. I so I saw so I didn't know so one I did not know that the show After Midnight existed, and two I did not know that Jeff Probst was going to be a guest on said show. So I'm just mind rotting, casually scrolling TikTok. And all of a sudden, Jeff Probst shows up on my TikTok account saying that I'm a cutie. And I'm like, what is even happening right now? I can so confused, sent this to Mike immediately and was like, please explain. <laughs> I do not know what this is. I do not know why this is here, but I need someone to tell me about this thing because it was so funny to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I didn't get the reference either, but again, I'm watching this video and it didn't placate me it motivated me to uh, move forward with my day. Now, knowing that, that the great Jeff Probst thinks me, Jordan Kalish, Drop dead cutie. No, 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 no. I thought it was the person most likely to send messages to cuties, right? Oh, Isn't okay. that well? What I'm still going with I'm, I'm still going with Deese as the cutie. Wait, okay. Let, let, we, we, have, we, have, we have the we have, we have the luxury dimension. Let's do this, yeah. And the next person voted to be a cutie who sends their friends oh. videos is you. Is you. okay? So. So we're so both where, right. Where, where are the cuties who send the videos? Correct. So and that's I'm the why one I had who knocks. I'm the cutie who sends the video. It felt like those emails where it's like share to go, for getting good luck or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Like chain, that was like, how it, felt. it felt like I have to share this video because otherwise I'm not a cutie who sends their friends videos. But like, do people send their friends videos? Does that a thing anymore? How do you communicate with your sibling? My sister and I only send each other videos. We do not actually talk to each other. I, I videos of each other? No, 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 no. We send videos like, to each other. Like like little mini see. cameos? Like, hey, hey, sis, this is hey. Liana. How's it going? I heard it's your birthday. <laughs> Just wanted to say hi. This message comes from Liana. Yeah, I, I, first off, I would be that uh, boomer that like responds in the comments tagging a person to be like, Hey, watch this video. I, I don't necessarily send, maybe that says more about my own social situation. I'm also intrigued by the syntax of the next person to be a cutie. So does this imply there was some sort of lineage to it? Is there some sort of cutie winners hall of fame of like, these are the previous cuties who are most likely to send videos to their friends. You're the next one in line. Congratulations. I think it does imply that. Yeah, the next person, which is interesting. <laughs> yeah, because... what happened also, to the previous yeah. person? <laughs> he he <laughs> uses that phrase, though. The next person voted out. He voted turns out. over the vote. Yeah, so he likes to say the next person. I mean, person. He, he more so does like the third person voted out of Survivor, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, yeah so I think you could have said the person, blah, 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 blah. Right? Like you didn't I, Yeah. Mean, I'm just fearful of what happened to the previous cutie. Is there a shelf life mm. to this? Is like mm. the cutie only able to serve a term of one, maybe two years before they're no longer deemed cute or they don't send videos anymore. They're like, we got to find another cutie. Or it's like a one week cycle, right? Like you were voted out in this cycle or voted the cutie to send their friends videos. And now we're moving on to the next cutie to send their friend videos is you. And also the other thing, cause we didn't watch the video. I just pulled the audio, but in, and Mike pointed this out this. So he holds up a vote, right? Like the next person voted, blah, blah, blah. He opens it up and it says you in like all caps, big font, giant well, sign. <laughs> here's the other thing. It's not written on a typical survivor parchment. It's written on by an eight and a half by 11 yeah. sheet of paper that they just grabbed from the printer. Yes. Hastily done with a marker. Jordan, I think you played LRGs that had more production quality in the ballots than what happened here on after midnight. So I, I, I think, I think you are correct about that. Uh, you, you know, playing, playing at a park in Brooklyn, it might not have that the HD cameras that come along with CBS survivor, but we do have like legit voting paper. And and we have we do have like the real survivor pen that they uh, that they use on that they sell on CBS.com. Oh, so now that's the, pretty cool. My other question is, who's voting? 
Who cast the vote in this case? Did Whoever Jeff... thinks you're a cutie. No. No, because Jeff revealed oh, the Jeff's votes. Did Jeff vote. vote and reveal the votes? Yeah, like he's re like he went to the urn to grab the vote. So the who, vote, who the is soul vote. the secret admirer? Who's the one that I mean, voted you the ooh. cutie? Ooh. Oh my god. <laughs> who wrote I'm a it? secret admirer. I love that. And also, if that's the case, listen, there's a fairly wide number of people watching. Who's the you? It's it's, it's like the, the whoever's year... watching the video. No, I think it was like the year when the Times person of the year or whatever <laughs> was, was like, you. it was like a mirror and it was like, you. <laughs> I think it was that kind of energy. Yay, we did it. We but did if, it. It's but if cute. I'm watching this with the two of you and Jeff says, mm -hmm. the next person voted cutie most likely to send their friend's video is you. It's got to be one of us, right? It can't be a three-way tie. That's just pure mockery of the game. Well, you don't send your friends videos, so you're immediately out of the running. So it could have been a mistaken vote. People I. get voted out mistakenly oh. for so many yeah. other reasons. <laughs> it's How, a, can I, you have a point there. It, <laughs> I it says, my yeah. shot in the dark. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it says you, vote. not not y'all. So it can't be all of us. You're right. It has I think if you're, if you're watching in a room by yourself, then it's definitely just you. It's, it's whoever's watching the video. So interestingly, it's discouraging being social because if you're in a room with other people, then there's confusion. You really want to be that person sitting solo dolo, scrolling through TikTok and be like, wait, I'm the person that was voted that way. Or third option, was this person voting Jeff Probst as the cutie? Ooh, I don't that think That the so. you was referring to me, what, not okay. you. I figured it out. This is Sue Hawk trying to vote for Yule. <laughs> <laughs> and he is a cutie that may send his friend's he's a, video. He's a so cutie I believe and she it. spells word wrongs. And, and and there's no name closer to you than Yule in Survivor, right? So I think yeah. Wow, that's they got Sue Hawk at, for this video directed at um, Yule Kwan. She says, you know what? I'm not going to go back on Survivor, but I'll do an at midnight plug on TikTok. I don't really, I know what that is, of course. Yeah, uh, we we did it. It's Yule. I'm the problem. We, did it. we figured it out. <laughs> All right, then Jordan, that's one. You got 117 more to yeah, go. <laughs> exactly. Good luck listing your Taylor Swift songs with yeah. all puns that include Survivor contestants. Double puns, so, Liana. Look what, look what you made me do, Kim, so Kim's sister. <laughs> what, look what Yule made me do. Look what Yule made me do, yes. Okay, so you can't use Yule for all of them. <laughs> look what Yule like made you. me do, Kim. It's an incredible song title. Uh, okay, what about like all the, the, the season 10 Palau minute versions of all these songs? <laughs> Palau version. <laughs> Oh my gosh. I don't know so enough funny. Taylor Swift songs to do these puns, but if I got a list up, I could probably do it. Well, we have Beyuled. Which one is that? Uh, Make the Whole World Shimmer. It's a, it's a song called Bejeweled by Taylor Swift. Okay, okay. Give me another Taylor Swift song. I'll try to I'll try to UFI it. We are never getting back together. Uh, we are never getting back to Tevin. <laughs> That's we horrible. are never getting back together. To Tevin. We are Tevin getting back together. No, that's I this is bad. That, that was a bad one. Cut it, cut it from the podcast. No, no, we're this is the this is the highlight. This is the we are never go, we are never going back to tribal. <laughs> I love I love the idea of Jordan just sticking in like just it doesn't matter, just any survivor name. So hey, you heard like, my one you heard my one dog. Also, uh, I I do think it would be we are never ever getting Baka together, right? Baca together. Yes, that's oh that that's good. good. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. I'm exhausted. <laughs> well, I think, <laughs> listen, I won, but I think we all won because we got to experience all... Liana make a very dirty cast even dirtier in the process. <laughs> to My finish... favorite thing to do. Well, to finish things off, let's rinse this mud off a bit like we're in the Survivor opening as we throw it to Jordan. As per usual, we want to highlight a charity or cause that is important to our guests on the B&B. &B. What do you have this week, Jordan? So, so I have actually two charities that, I'm, well, arguably three charities that I'm going to talk about, and I'm sorry if I'm going overboard here, but it's it's for it's for a good cause. So, unfortunately, uh, la last month my my dog Jackson passed away, and it was very okay. sad. Jackson, I, I we had him since is my the, the family dog. We had him since uh, 2012, and he was great. He was a, he was uh, fun loyal, loving dog. You know, they, it's very cliche to say your dog is your best friend, but he was my best friend. So I really miss Jackson. Um, and Jackson happened to be a rescue dog. So rescuing animals, I think is, you know, adopt, don't shot. I think totally the way to go. There are so many dogs and cats and other, other pets that need homes. So the animal shelter that we rescued Jack from was actually called Caddis 
assistance and it is in the suburbs of uh, Westchester, New York. Uh, their, uh, their website is catassistanceny.org. Uh, they're located, like I said, in, in, in Westchester and they mainly have cats, but they did have one dog when we went uh, and it was Jackson. So we got very lucky with that. So cat assistance, um, great charity. Also, we have another rescue dog. Uh, his name is Cooper. He's an American Foxhound. And we got him also from a local shelter uh, called A Good Dog Rescue. It's also located in Westchester, New York. And their website is agooddogrescue.org. So these are the two, uh, the, the two dog, uh, dog slash cat rescue services that are near and dear to my heart because of the great dogs that we have gotten from them. Uh, Cooper uh, is, I just saw him this morning. He is, uh, lives with my parents. He's my, really my mom's dog, but he is, uh, he's fantastic. Very playful. Um, really misses Jackson too. It's very, very, very cute that he like c- consistently goes over to his bed and it's uh, sad, but um, you know, they, they, they definitely loved each other. Uh, so if you are looking for, for, to donate to a good cause, either one of these shelters. And if you don't trust these local, you know, that these are, these are kind of local to me, ASPCA, always a great, uh, um, you know, a charity to donate to if you are looking to help uh, animals in need. Amazing. Thank you so much, Jordan, for highlighting that. I mean, listen, animal companions, uh, much like good alliances, you know, stick with us for life for a long time. And so it's, it's always good to have resources to go to when we're in need of one. This was such a great time as per usual. Now, people might not know, I mentioned this at the top of the podcast, that Twish is back in a brand new fashion. It's kind of reached its own new era. So would you like to plug that and anything else you might be working on? Yeah, so Rob is taking on the Titans of the New Era. Every week he is uh, facing a New Era Survivor contestant in trivia. It is after the exit interview, and we also have our uh, our, our own separate videos on YouTube. We have had Marianne, Marianne on. Uh, we have had Dwight. Uh, this week we are having another really fun guest. I won't spoil who it is yet, uh, but it is uh, someone who I think everyone is going to like to hear from from the New Era. So you could always check that out on uh, after the exit interview or on YouTube, uh, and then follow me on Twitter at Jordan Kalish with uh, with my uh, Survivor takes and uh, and and you know it's, it's March, baby, it's spring training. The the Yankee takes are going to be happening, so you might have to mute me at some point. All right, hopefully not for a long, long time. Liana, who has remained muted for most of this podcast due to the exorbitant amount of marching band outside of her place mass singers back what would you like to preview as well as the other reality tv stuff you're doing yes so mike uh mass singer is indeed back puya and i covered the very first episode so that should be out already and then of course we're going to be doing weekly coverage throughout of season 11 and then i am going to hop off this podcast and hop on another because it is drag race season as well baby we're going to be recording with lavina as our guest this week as beth is still recovering from her tonsil slap and ad- appendix removal her tonsil, tonsil removal slap <laughs> well, i was like what's the name tonsillectomy Ectomy. i think right tonsil- yeah. i was like ton- uh, ton- tonsil slap I tried is to- very aggressive well, no because i tr- <laughs> i tried to put in appendicitis like a- appendectomy mm-hmm. tonsillectomy whatever anyway it's not important right now the music is there's so much happening <laughs> in my brain so uh, now you're yeah, feeling how me- jess is feeling <laughs> I know exactly. That's what I'm saying. And like, I am in a comfy place, fed and watered. Like I'm, I am fine. I'm a plant. plant. Yeah. (laughs) Way to plant. And okay. So, uh, what else? Oh yes. I'm doing it. So so traders is done the U S season and I'm going to be joining Puya to talk about the feedback. So we're going to be doing the feedback show together. So very excited to talk about the exciting finale and reunion. And then the last thing is that there is going to be a group of us survivor dra- like survivor drafters who are going to be joining Shannon to talk about survivor <laughs> AU which I am so excited for yes. I'm living for this AU season. So I think it's Chappelle, Puya, myself, and Shannon, the ones of us that are watching AU, um, are all going to be hopping on with her to talk about um, these next batch of episodes that are like happening right now. Yeah, check it out. I mean, check out both AU and that podcast, which is sure to be an absolute delight. Uh, you mentioned traders. I had the opportunity to speak with the winner or winners of the Traders U.S. Season 2. If you saw that ending, there was a lot to talk about. I had a really great time there. And of course, I had a fantastic time talking with Jess as well. I think there was a lot of clarity and honesty to her comments. I think a lot of people found them very refreshing that although the situation was far from ideal from Jess's perspective, she was very upfront about 
the not so great time that she had, which listen, we, we want it to happen, but when it doesn't, we want people to be upfront about it, but had a great time talking with her. She ate some ants for me by the end, not some uncles. So it was a really great time overall. You can check all that out over at parade.com uh, over on post show recaps. We are slowly sunsetting the entire podcast network by doing some countdowns. Grace and I uh, were joined by Latanya Starks to do the top 10 TV episodes of the past 10 years. This week, we're doing the top 10 movies of the past 10 years. Jordan, could you pick a favorite movie of the past 10 years for yourself? Favorite movie? of the, Okay, I, I know what it is. My favorite movie in the past 10 years, I think, is Parasite. Okay, interesting. Coming from up out of the basement uh, to yes. make the opinion known. Well, we'll see where Parasite will chart this coming week on Post Show Recaps. And listen, the CBS boat is uh, just starting to hum along as the Amazing Race is coming back this week. It'll be myself, Jess, and Rob. And we're doing something a little different this time around for coverage. So we'll preview that this week along with the 90-minute premiere of The Amazing Race 36. Alongside the 90-minute episode 3 of Survivor 46. It is so odd to say we're going back to 90 minutes next week on Survivor. But indeed we are. We're getting back more into the regular flow. Really excited to see where we go from here. To Liana and Jordan's point, there's been a lot of other stuff brewing, especially on NAMI. A lot of pressure building in these past five days. So I'm hopeful that Yanu is going to pull it out, even just to see what these other people can do, let alone for like the sake of these poor four individuals that are on this woebegotten purple tribe. But no matter what happens, Liana and I will be joined next week by Big Brother Canada is just starting up and will be joined by one of its luminaries, Kevin Jacobs, winner Ooh. of Big Brother Canada 10. We'll be joining Leon and I to break down episode three of Survivor 46, a man who thrived and oftentimes caused chaos. I think it'll be very fun to get his opinions on a very chaotic season. And of course, we want your thoughts and your game ideas. Feel free to send them to us, rhapbnb at gmail.com or hashtag rhapbnb on social media. No idea is a bad idea here. We are gobbling them down like ants, but our mouths are never full. So next week, Leon and I will be joined by Kevin Jacobs to break down episode three of Survivor 46. Special thanks to the entire RHAP team behind the scenes for getting the audio and video up for your listening hopeful pleasure and Will from America for his fantastic theme song. Until next time, everybody, we'll check you out at your next day.